All right. Off to the races. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, buckle your seatbelt because Dr. Peter Rogers is back with a brand new incredible talk about the true causes of obesity. Please welcome Dr. Rogers. You, we appreciate how much you research your topics and your, your the thoughtfulness that you put into your slides. Yeah, well, thank you. It's okay. a very important uh, topic. Yeah, yeah, well, causes of obesity. And so I started out with a nice painting here. A lot of people feel like they're looking like Mona Lisa, a little heftier, and they hope to look a little more like Venus. And the good news is we can help you with that. Great, uh, I cannot wait. Where's my page down, buddy? This one or this one? This one. It's not. It's not working. Let's click this one. Okay, so here I love this painting, uh, "Lifeline" by Winslow Homer. I'm gonna save you. All right, now what are we talking about? Basically, the definition of obesity is a body mass index over thirty. Um, morbid obesity is when it's over forty. And the big thing happening in obesity is right around a little before 1980, the curve just starts zooming upwards and it's going up, you know, five or 10 percentage points every decade. Right now, um, it's about 40% of persons are obese in the United States. So it's incredibly high there. All right. Okay, now we're gonna talk about some important stuff. Uh, I just figured one thing we're gonna ask, I get asked this question, why do women have big butts? And the reason women have big butts is they store more omega-3 fats in that area because it's an energetically efficient location to carry it. And it helps for the baby's brain development and their eyes. It's, a, you know, the good thing about omega-3s is it's very fluidized fat in the plasma cell membrane to facilitate rapid neuronal conduction, okay? And basically that's kind of like how a man senses if a woman is fertile or not, the relatively narrow waist compared to the gluteal region and he always does that. He doesn't, it's subconscious. He can't help it. A man always does that because it's very dangerous to approach a woman romantically. You might get beat up by her brother or husband or boyfriend, you know? So if you say to yourself, your, your subconscious mind says to yourself, if you can't even potentially make a baby, why take that risk? If, Cause if you if a woman who's fat, you know, historically meant that she was pregnant. So, cause people didn't used to be fat. Uh, but anyways, um, there's a lot of other things a little different. Women have a little bit smaller shoulders. They got less hair on their back. Maybe they're more highly evolved. Um, on the one hand, I think my wife's family might have evolved from apes, but mine was created in the image of God. Um, why am I giving this lecture? Uh, my male friends asked me. They said, does writing books or giving lectures help you to make money or get laid? I said, no. They said, then why do you do it? And I said, because it's a great thing. It really helps people, and I enjoy studying this stuff. And looking at the, now I'm gonna talk a little bit to help men here, this next set of slides. You know, the cycle of life, the voyage of life. These are beautiful paintings by Thomas Cole. You know, coming out of the birth canal here with mama, the guardian angel, everything is great and abundant. And then the young man is all full of vigor and testosterone. He can't wait to pursue his dream goal in the sky. And this is a magnificent painting. Thomas Cole shows the water goes around a bend and then it starts picking up speed going near some rocks over here. And I love this painting, The Voyage of Life by Thomas Cole from the 1830s, 1840s. And here's where a lot of us find ourselves in middle life, uh, middle age, where the water's picking up, we're going over the rocks, the oars have fallen out of the boat, we're getting kind of fat, you know, who knows how things are going in the rest of our life, our marriages, our jobs, et cetera. And so we're going to help you optimize your health. Some of the other stuff you got to figure out for yourself. But um, I think this kind of captures the feeling of a middle age uh, crisis or middle age difficulties, if you will. Oh, a lot of our meat eater friends are, um, you know, impotent from all the atherosclerosis generated by the sad diet, the high meat diet, and the processed food diet. And I even made a little uh, impotence prayer for them, which uh, we'll, we'll just skip over it for now, but it's there. And that's Lazarus uh, coming back to life there. Um, here is a lovely painting of Copernicus. And the big Copernicus moment for a lot of people when they start studying health is a realization, you know, in med school, you sort of learn most diseases are idiopathic, which means the doctor's an idiot and the patient's pathetic. Nobody knows what causes hypertension. Um, atherosclerosis seems to be cholesterol, but we don't really understand it, et cetera, et cetera. But once you start to really study disease more, and I think the key thing is studying epidemiology, one realizes it's primarily due to diet and toxicology. And so we're going to talk about that. So this is a lovely painting of Copernicus by Jan Mateko. 
Okay, and then I just showed this painting here, and this is Reception at the Court of Versailles uh, by Jean Leon Jerome. And what this symbolizes is when a person takes on a low fat vegan diet, it's obviously the best thing to do once you've studied nutrition and health, but it's as if the entire rest of the society looks upon you as an outsider. It's such an unusual, rare thing in our society. Less than 1% one person, one percent of persons, well less than that. I don't know the exact percent, but it's very few. And it's very few in the medical community too. So all of a sudden, everyone looks upon you strangely. You know you're right, but it's a weird feeling. The whole financial and power structure of the world looks at you as being an oddball, even though you are the one who carries the truth. Okay, um, I also thought, you know, it's kind of a little bit obscured here up in the corner, but you know, one of the great things about the sort of system of low fat vegan and Dr. McDougall uh, was what he said is you got to eat a lot of starch. And if you eat a lot of starch, pretty much everything else will go well for you. And I think of it as being like a lifeline. That's another reason why I like that painting by Winslow Homer, the lifeline, because if you just eat a lot of starch and don't even know what else to do, anything else, you'll be OK for a while. And that'll give you time to figure every, everything else out. So I kind of, you know, made a song for the vegan movement. Amazing starch, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was fat, but now I'm thin, was blind, but now I see. I actually got more words to it, but what's happening is my regular computer, I can't get it to work. So I'm working on another laptop computer and it and it's a different operating system. It doesn't show my entire slide. So I, I had more lyrics to the song, not that anyone cares, but some of my slides, the bottom might be a little bit clipped off. Um, now I'm gonna show you some stuff from the Nauru. The reason I show you the Nauru, it's an island located just north of Australia is because they're the fattest people in the world. And we're gonna be talking about what causes obesity today. So the Nauru uh, men here in 1914 are very skinny, very healthy. You know, populations that ate their traditional natural diets tend to be very healthy and thin and robust. But what happened was the soil of their island was very high in phosphorus. And the Western mining companies, they found that um, incredibly profitable soil to take phosphate from. You can use it for fertilizers and other things. And they mined almost 90% of the land from the island. And of course, when they mined all that, um, that soil, they then had to bring in processed food from the Western countries to feed the people. And the average Nauru adult now weighs 220 pounds. They're the fattest people in the whole world. And I think that's relevant because what is one of the big things that's taken off since 1980 in the Western diet? It's all these processed foods. And processed foods, you know, eating milk and eggs and dairy and all that stuff and butter will make you fat, but processed foods will make you even fatter. They've got 72% of the adults are obese, 40% with frank diabetes. And it kind of reminded me, you know, they've lost all their soil to make natural foods or dependent on food being shipped in. They're at risk for, you know, extinction and other places. What's going to happen to them too? It reminds me of the Easter Island statues. And this is relevant too, because Easter Island is also called Rapa Nui. And that relates to the discovery of how mammalian target or rapamycin works. So you're going to be hearing a lot about mTOR. And that's where the mTOR name comes from. That, people ask about that a lot. Here's two papers about uh, UPFs. So a UPF is an ultra processed food. So a processed food could be something as simple as just put a little salt on it. Um, and, you know, salting for preservatives, for example. Um, However, ultra process is when it has multiple ingredients on it. It's actually a classification, Nova system of classification. So I'll call them UPFs, these ultra processed foods where there's, you know, two, three, four, five, ten or more ingredients. And, you know, when I was a kid, I used to watch the show Lost in Space. The robot would talk to Will Robinson and say, warning, warning, danger. And what I'm saying is these processed foods are more dangerous than you think. You'd be amazed how many things are in there that make you sick. Here's another study. Um, so what I've done is I include the studies and I try to outline the key points. And you can always look these up if you like. Just a 10% increase in ultra processed foods caused an 18% increase in obesity. <laughs> so you don't want to be eating those. Here's another study of the Seventh Day Adventists, and what they basically saw was the Adventist vegans had the best body weights, less than a BMI of 25. That's normal, BMI below 25, and it was only the vegan uh, Seventh Day Adventists in this group. Once they went lacto ovo, they were above 25, and then the more animal products, the fatter they get. And if they eat processed foods, it gets worse. And the vegans from Seventh-day Adventists are sort of religious vegans. They're not even necessarily health vegans. They're quite a variable population. But that, that's the point I want to make. The more vegan somebody is and the more low-fat vegan they are, the more likely they are to be skinny and healthy and not have diabetes. Um, the classic 
comparison population is the Pima, who have lived now in Arizona. They used to be together with the Tatahumata in northern Mexico, like around the Sierra Madre Mountains, Copper Canyon, and whatnot. Tatahumata means fleet of foot. They're famous for being ultra marathoners, and they have kept their old fashioned diet and they stay thin. By the way, here's a picture of the Pima from the 1800s, how they used to look. Look at these guys. This guy looks like a college wrestler, looks like a tough college wrestler right here, you know, 149 pounds or something. All these guys look really good, the Pima. That's how they used to look. Now they're all real fat in general, not all, but in general, they have tremendous obesity and they end up going for tons of all these standard Western disease surgeries, gallbladders, open hearts, cabbage, coronary bypass graft, sigmoids for diverticulitis, diabetes amputation, Tadahumara are running marathons. Tadahumara population eating their old diet, corn, beans, squash, local greens. They don't have any obesity. They don't have any hypertension. Their average total cholesterol is 136. Um, there's some papers here. If anybody wants to look at them, on Tadahumata. This guy, um, Connor, he's actually, you think, friends with uh, T. Colin Campbell. He did a lot of the research on the Tadahumata, you know, showing their lipid levels, studying their diet. And then, you know, out of curiosity, they fed him a westernized diet. And as soon as they fed him a westernized diet, it actually took about two weeks. I'll show you the graph here in one sec. The, um, they bumped up real fast. Okay, here's the graph. What was interesting was they actually maintained their lipid levels reasonably well until about two weeks and two weeks and sort of they went up very quickly so I was a little surprised it took two weeks but you know it just goes to show because it's not genetic there's been lots of other examples of emigration studies like with the Japanese and whatnot that uh, once people start eating the western diet it doesn't matter who they are they all get the same diseases the Yanomamo in South America on the border of Brazil and Venezuela same old story they don't add salt to their food in their natural environment they eat primarily plant foods. They don't have any hypertension. They have the same blood pressure in their teens and their elderly years. Uh, so I'm just making the point, this is epidemiological evidence uh, supporting a plant-based diet. And it's the same everywhere. Here's Kenya. You know, Kenya is of course currently super famous for all its world champion runners. Got the best marathoner in the world, like Kipu Chogi. He like ran a marathon in like two hours and one minute. Um, anyways, uh, so here's Kenya. And then another thing too, you'll hear a lot of persons in America, oh, African-Americans, they have so much high blood pressure. It's so sad causes tons of kidney failure. What are you going to do? Maybe it's salt sensitivity. That's what I learned like in residency stuff, but it's actually not really true. Then um, 1929, this guy Donison and whatnot, the group, they, they studied the blood pressures of persons in Kenya. These are adult hospital patients admitted, 1,800 patients, zero with hypertension, zero, zero. So, I mean, that's incredible numbers. So the point is, you know, the diet has a major role. And that's why when I read in a textbook, like a textbook of cardiovascular physiology, the books will still say 90, 95% of hypertension is essential hypertension, meaning that the cause is unknown. That's not true. We know number one, hypertension is due to high fat diets. Number two, high sodium diets. And number three, dehydration contributes as well. Um, a lot of people think it's mostly fat. Other people think it's mostly the sodium or a combination. Uh, anyways, you've seen this before. I talked about the diet nirvana pyramid. And this, I think, is primarily for a person who already kind of understands they need to improve their diet, they're working out, they're making progress. Um, I thought, though, a lot of times when you're starting out, it doesn't seem almost like this. It almost seems like you're stuck in a hole. You're deep down and you're trying to crawl out of a pit. I'll jokingly call it like health hell, like you're trying to climb out of Plato's cave, if you will. And I love this painting right here. It's called Sadak in Search of the Waters of Forgetting by John Martin. And so here's the Sadak. He's trying to climb obstacle after obstacle to work his way to the light and the warmth. Um, so I thought that was a beautiful painting. And then another painting that got my attention is this one. It's from a book called The Inferno. And it's sort of based on Dante's Inferno. And his guide was Virgil. And they're in hell. And what I thought about this is like health hell. And I actually, I, I, I kind of obscured a little bit here, but I have all the different rivers are named. I had the first river flowing caffeinated beverages. The other one with high fructose sweetened beverages. The other one was um, filled with aspartame and MSG beverages. And then alcohol was the bottom, the worst, deepest pit of hell with pancreatitis. And I had all these diseases made for it. For some reason, I thought that was fun one time. Uh, these paintings are beautiful, by the way, by Dino Di Durante. This is the cover of his book, uh, which is a collection of paintings on that theme. And then what's sort of the goal of all this? What do I think is you know a rule of thumb to go by for health? I think you kind of want to live like Adam and Eve but with you know indoor heating, indoor plumbing, in the sense they don't eat any processed food. They eat natural things that grow outside. It's like Genesis 129, I've made every food for you. 
And so I think that leads to optimal health. And being healthy is good. It makes you more resilient and you're happier when you're healthy. So this is my favorite of the Adam and Eve paintings. This one's by uh, Jan Bruegel and Peter Paul Rubin. Okay, and then here is another painting I love. This one is the School of Athens. And what I noticed, you know, upon studying the Renaissance is there was a competition amongst all the artists to try to produce the best painting, the best mural. And this desire to create a magnificent work of art led to great improvements in art. And so what I notice in the modern world of nutrition, we have something like that, I think, on the internet with these health video channels. So Chef AJ's channel is kind of like the school of Chef AJ for nutrition, where experts come from all different locations and try to share their new knowledge and bring new knowledge. And I think it's a great thing. It leads to rapid progress. It helps a lot of people. So I thought that was kind of a neat thing. School of Athens by Raphael. Okay, and then here was a little bit of a symbolic thing. I thought, you know, Chef AJ is kind of the leader of the vegan community, the mama of the vegan community. And some of her sayings, no sofas, veggies for breakfast. If it's in your house, it's in your mouth. And these are some of the lighthouses that guide people towards healthy living. Bring me your fat, your diabetic, your hypertensive masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. And I will teach them about starch, the god of veganism, who will bring them new life who bring new life into them, who breathe new life into them. So that's a parody of the Emma Lazarus inscription on the, the uh, uh, Statue of Liberty there. Okay, so now some of the basic dietary patterns. You know, Chef AJ can tell you everything you need to know about what to eat and all that. Dr. McDougall will help confirm it with a little more epidemiology information and clinical experience. And then sort of what I bring to the table, I think, is I'll talk a little bit more about the biochemistry, the toxicology, and the brain health, for example. And so... A lot of the stuff you might have heard it before, you know, Chef AJ's book tells you everything you need to know. It's the best book on weight loss, secrets of weight loss and unprocessed. And, you know, you're going to learn about caloric density, an essential thing to be aware of and the concept of the food order and all that stuff helping you uh, with Dr. McDougal. What he says is true. The fat you eat is the fat you wear, which is another reason why I'm not enthusiastic about high fat diets and all these high fat nibbles that people like, you know, nuts, seeds and omega-3. I think we don't need that. This is sort of what I would call a school of low-fat veganism. I actually sort of even would call it very low-fat. The reason I say that is if you read a lot of studies, they're confusing. They'll say the low-fat group, and that group will be eating 30% fat, which I would consider a high-fat diet. So because of that, for terminology's sake, in comparing the, the nutrition literature, I would call these diets where we're talking about in the ballpark of 10% fat or less, very low-fat diets, okay? All right, so here's just a quick summary. If you want to look through these diets and figure out where you're at, what you want to do, you know, Kempner's diet was probably the most restrictive and he was taking care of very sick patients. And typically they were monitored in a, you know, a, basically you could call them an inpatient setting. They were living in the Rice House apartments around the hospital, but he was checking their labs frequently and whatnot because his diet does have the risk of becoming hyponatremic, too low in sodium, for example. Um, he also had to be very careful with the kidney failure patients where it was a little bit unpredictable as to their ability to excrete potassium, for example. The Spartan vegan diet is what I call my version of it, which is kind of austere. I like it because it's simple. I only eat starches, fruits, and vegetables um, and zero processed foods. There's the Dr. Esselstyn diet, which is also very, very, very low fat. That's sort of the main feature. Uh, Dr. McDougall and, and Chef AJ, they work more as I would call it a, a general population to just try to get them to be healthy, a little more flexibility, more recipes and variety. Um, and then I would say the biggest other group of health vegans is the high fat health vegans. And that's sort of a highly debated topic, kind of an emotional touchy topic. Me personally, I'm a believer in the very low fat component because I think that I'll explain why, but I think there comes a point for a lot of people where it's as if their body really wants to be fat and they just can't get away with this stuff or they tend to get fat. Um, philosophic vegans for animal rights, a lot of times they don't eat healthy. Uh, they're just doing it for other reasons. Uh, the religious plant eaters like the Seventh-day Adventists, they're quite variable. Some of them are quite healthy, many of them are not. And then the more animal products you start adding, the more the BMI drifts up, atherosclerosis, cancer, et cetera. And then these other diets, I think that primarily emphasize animal foods and high fat foods in my opinion, those are like the, pay, the pathway, you know, highway to health, hell, if you will. I think they're very unhealthy diets. Um, just so you know, I went through this myself. I got very fat in my sort of early to mid 30s. I was working too much. I was trying to do two fellowships simultaneously, had a baby with the wife at home, and I authored a textbook that year. Um, and so I was drinking seven cups of coffee and processed food. 
and I ballooned up to about 220, which is real fat for me. Then I knew I have to get turn my life around. So I moved to a new house where I could exercise more. And I started exercising a lot. I had a pool there. I, I managed the pool and I lost all the weight. I would walk a lot when I would eat. I would walk when I would read. Um, here was the pool. It was a lot of fun. We had a, a, a place for the kids to play in the, the thing. We had a full court basketball court. We had a spot to hit tennis balls against the wall. I put a net up around the back so we could hit, hit them and not hit them in the neighbor's yard and piss off the neighbor. Um, and it was great. Um, I turned one of the upstairs bathrooms, upstairs bedrooms into a racquetball court. And I love this place. Uh, my kids love the place. Uh, my friends love the place. All the guys love the place, but my kid was about going into seventh grade and I came home from work and he's kind of sad look on his face. And he says, dad, you're a bad parent. And I said, why? And he says, because you don't help me with basketball. The other boy's dad, he coaches the basketball team. The other boy's dad, he practices with his son. He says, all you do is work all the time. And I said, well, buddy, let me think about it. And so what I did was I had a friend who's a good carpenter and we boarded up the windows. I moved the portable basketball court inside the house and we had this living room. We, were, we weren't using it for anything but storage. And the kids started practicing three and a half hours a day of basketball. He got really good, but my wife did not like it. She kind of went crazy, apeshit bananas. Um, the house was too noisy, bouncing the ball. She said, I'm breaking the foundation, lowering the property value. House is not a gymnasium. And we ended up having to move. So we had to sell that house. I'm so sorry. I missed that house. Now in the new place, I kind of live in the basement, kind of like a man cave. And I have a place to lift weights. And it's nothing like my old house. I miss the old house. But the good side is I, I got time because it's my wife's house. She manages all the, the issues of the house. And I can just sit around, you know, making videos or uh, writing books. Um, this is what I call high rep squats, which is a great exercise as you get older. On a, It's called a safety squat bar with the handles in front. So I'll just do one set of high rep squats um, a week and it keeps me pretty strong. And it's like doing high, high intensity interval training um, makes you strong and it gives you good endurance. I try to walk a lot of stairs on, on a frequent basis when I get a chance. Um, I got a wrestling man. I'm kind of training some, one of my, my nephews is a wrestler. I'm kind of training him a little bit. Um, so anyways, that's how I'm maintaining my health. And I, I kept the weight off now, gosh, for about getting close to 20 years now. Um, Here's some obesity theories. Now, what makes people fat? Okay, the body needs to store some fat in case there's a time of starvation that'll keep you alive. Dr. McDougall gave a previous lecture where he talked about um, what makes people fat, and he showed a bunch of slides of these Irish starvation guys. And typically, for an average guy, it takes about 60 days to starve to death. And so basically, to help prevent yourself from starving to death, you need to carry some fat on you. Women tend to carry more fat on them because they're also carrying some fat in case they get pregnant to generate energy for the baby. Um, the big surge in obesity, like we talked about, was in about 1980. And so the question is, what's new since 1980? What has increased a lot? Of course, there's more oil in the food. Big thing is there's a lot more ultra processed food. Um, there is a lot of MSG in the food and it's often hidden as manufactured free glutamate and it often has different types of names. I don't know the significance of this stuff or this stuff. I do know that atrazine is uh, highly estrogenic and it causes insulin resistance. That's on all the corn, all the GMO corn. We talked before about soy, uh, you know, how much that contributes. I don't know so much primarily as an obesogen. High fructose corn syrup is an obesogen, and we're going to explain why that is. Um, it also often is contaminated with mercury. Um, there's a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals, which are typically estrogenic in the water, in the milk, food, cosmetic soaps. We'll talk about that. And those have been described as obesogens. The guy, the scientist by the name of Bruce Bloomberg is the one who coined the word obesogen, a chemical that makes you fat. And there's a lot of them. And I think one of the useful things to do is uh, learn how to recognize them and avoid them. And you'll markedly decrease your risk of being fat. Because if you're exposed to an obesogen, you're more likely to gain weight, even if you eat the same amount of food. It just tends to make people get fatter. Um, the MSG is a flavor enhancer, so it makes food taste good. It makes you more likely to be addicted to the food. And the companies know this. They also measure, of course, it's been called the bliss point. Um, I think the guy's name was Moss who wrote a book about that. Salt, sugar, fat, and they titrate these things. They have a research group come in so they find the bliss point most likely to get you addicted. You know, they joke about, you've seen it like on the chips, you, you can't stop eating one because it'll taste so good. Um, and we're naturally programmed to prefer high calorie foods. I think that's programmed into us to help us survive in an environment of scarcity. Okay, we also have a set point. 
and a set point in our brain that makes us weigh the same amount and eat the same amount. And the only way to change the set point is to change what you eat. I'm going to talk about it just a little bit here, how leptin relates to the a set point. Leptin is a hormone made in lipid, alpha leptin, alpha lipid. Um, stress also makes people fat. The acute phase of the stress response is more physical. It's more of a you know, catecholamine. That means adrenaline and noradrenaline, also called epinephrine and norepinephrine. But stress when it's chronic, psychological chronic stress, you get more emphasis on the cortisol aspect of it. That's what predominates. And cortisol is like the opposite of melatonin. So it leads to some sleep deprivation. It causes a visceral fat uh, increase in obesity. Um, and all these things that can stress you out, loud noises, emotional problems, they all contribute to making you fatter. Now, another thing that often comes up, lots of people say how they love coffee, caffeine, whatever. But my feeling is caffeine just mimics acute stress. It raises the exact same hormones, catecholamines and cortisol. So to me, that's idiotic to say, oh, I'm stressed out. I need a cup of coffee or something. All you're doing is you're increasing those stress hormones. Um, so there's real problems with caffeine. Um, anytime a food is super profitable, things like caffeine and these other really popular profitable foods, they, they all of a sudden acquire this mythology of health benefits that are not really accurate. I'm going to go through caffeine a little more, but I think it's one of the most overrated foods. And don't get me wrong. I used to drink coffee for years. I didn't know any better. Um, and I'll explain why I don't do that anymore. Um, air pollution does also increase the risk of a person becoming fat. Persons who live in air polluted areas are more prone to fat. Okay. Caloric density. Um, you know, Chef AJ has got lots of lectures on all that. Basically, the higher the caloric density, the less you stretch your stomach. So the less uh, satisfaction or hunger you get. When you stretch your stomach, you change the ghrelin. You'll lower the ghrelin response. Ghrelin is a hormone. G for ghrelin, G for gastric. The stomach is gastric, so it's released from the stomach. And that provides some uh, satisfaction of hunger. Uh, so with these plant foods or low caloric density, you stretch the, the stomach with fewer calories, and you thus get some early satisfaction of hunger earlier. Um, a high fat diet causes insulin resistance. And that's going to cause, because the insulin's not working, the pancreas pumps out more, especially saturated fat does it amongst the fats. But insulin is an anabolic hormone. It's, it's a postprandial, a post eating hormone to tell the body to store energy. So it, it gets you to build up your fat stores. And then it does other things. Insulin does a lot more than help the body manage glucose. It also decreases blood brain barrier permeability to leptin. Leptin released from lipid from your fat stores normally goes to the brain and it'll help to shut off the eating response. Okay. So it helps enforce a set point to get you to stay at the same weight. So you can see the problem here when you get high fat causing insulin resistance, causing hyper hyperinsulinemia, the high insulin blocks the broad brain barrier from allowing more leptin to go in. Now, when leptin can't get in and go to the hypothalamus, the brain feels as if it's starving. It doesn't recognize that it's just ate a big meal and you'll tend to overeat. And we're going to talk a little more about that later in more detail, how that works. But the point is high fat meal is disrupting your ability to have a lowered set point. So reducing dietary fat helps you to lower your set point, set point of body weight. Starches are great because they are low in caloric density and a starch is a polymer of glucose. The body processes glucose different than fructose. We're going to talk about that some more. I think fruits are okay in limited quantities. I mean, there's a lot of people who eat tons of fruit and they're really healthy. Those are usually relatively young, relatively athletic people who exercise a lot. And I think if you're doing that, you can eat a lot of fruits. There's a very famous guy by the name of Arnstein. I think it's Mike Arnstein. He's an ultra marathon or world famous guy. He eats tons of fruits. He eats 25, 30 pounds a day and he's super fit. If you're exercising that much, you could do it. I know the mastering diabetes guy eats a lot of fruit. So what I'm saying is I know Durian Ryder eats a lot of fruit. All these guys that are quite athletic, young, and exercise a lot, they eat a lot of fruit. And I think that's great. They can handle all those calories. They can handle all that fructose. But for persons who don't exercise as much, um, they have to be careful about it. I've actually heard Dr. McDougall recommend only about limiting your fruit servings to about two per day, you know. Um, I eat more than that because I, I think I exercise a reasonable amount. I'd call it a moderate amount, not like those other guys, but a, a moderate amount. Okay, now we're going to, these obesogenic chemicals, most of them are estrogenic. And estrogen is a fat storage hormone. Estrogen levels go up during pregnancy to get the person to gain weight. That extra weight can be stored as energy for the baby. And 
Again, the guy who developed this obesogen hypothesis was uh, Bruce Bloomberg. He wrote a, a good book called Obesogens, and he sort of, they discovered this chemical called tributyl tin. It was used in um, anti-fouling paints on the, the bottoms of ships, so they wouldn't get all the barnacles growing on them. Uh, but then it got into the local animals, and he studied what the consequences of it were, and it makes animals get fat, and it also makes humans get fat. And there's a whole bunch of these estrogenic chemicals. I've talked about them before, and it's good to just recognize them in categories. You know, there's lots of them in plastics. They're in almost every personal care product. There's often several of them. For example, I wanted to use the safest shampoo. So I got one of these baby shampoos for newborn babies. Even that had at least two estrogenics and another chemical that was maybe an estrogenic. You know, the, the newborn baby has to be able to survive it. But the point I'm saying is even the safest shampoo had tons of them. So I stopped using shampoo. You don't really need shampoo. I mean, I don't have much hair, but you don't really need shampoo. Um, it made no difference. Once I stopped using shampoo, I don't know, a couple of years ago or something, I've never missed it, never used it since. Um, and, you know, maybe you got tons of hair you needed, but most people don't. You know, you read about these guys who lived in the 1700s, the 1800s, they almost never took a shower. All right. Um, let's see. Maybe that's why they had those wigs. All right. Um, foods. Well, we talked about these. A lot of these contain estrogens and then the herbicides and pesticides on them. Uh, list is kind of boring to go through, but it, it's all there. Uh, that's a big problem. I don't know. Here's one thing I thought was quite interesting. Okay, this was when a, when the high fat diet was fed to mice, the mice started forming new fat cells, and they formed new fat cells even though their old fat cells were not really maximum capacity. So to have a fat cell get bigger is called fat cell hypertrophy, enlargement of a given fat cell. Because everybody was taught in the past we only have a fixed number of fat cells and we don't get any more. But the point I'm making here is that's actually not correct. It's been shown now that we do produce increased new fat cells and you can form new fat cells, which puts you at risk, higher risk of becoming obese. And the way I can fit this into my understanding from my own personal experience, when I was a young guy, I was pretty strong. I was a college wrestler there and I never had a problem with being fat. But then when I was working all the time and I didn't exercise at all that fellowship year and I, and I you know, was drinking seven cups of coffee a day, eating kind of processed food and junk food, and I got fat. It's like ever since then, my body wants to be fat. It takes a lot of effort that I have to make sure I stay to my diet. And I do. I'm very comfortable sticking to my diet. But the point is, my body didn't used to want to be fat. My body used to like to be strong. Now it's like my body wants to be fat. And I have to put that extra effort. I think I changed my set point a little bit. And I've, you know, I've worked it back down. But I'm just saying it, it becomes harder. So what's the point of this? You don't ever want to be eating a lousy diet. And the sooner a person changes, the better. Because the more difficult it'll be later on to ever get your weight back under control. Okay, the rationale, real quick, for the low, very low-fat uh, plant-based diet of starches, vegetables, and a smaller amount of fruits, the fat just causes problems because it's going to increase insulin resistance. It's going to predispose you to obesity. And even if it doesn't cause that much insulin resistance, some of the other types of fat are less likely to cause insulin resistance. The obesity still, in its own way, releases free fatty acids into the blood and tends to lead to insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. We talked about the hyperinsulinemia. Uh, blocking lift and traversal of the blood brain barrier. So your set point starts drifting upwards. And as you eat the higher dietary fat, you accumulate it first in your subcutaneous tissues, you'll accumulate it then in your skeletal muscles, get insulin resistance worsening, then in your liver, and eventually in your pancreas, and you'll be full blown diabetes. So you're not going to win with fat. Um, animal protein is a problem too, because animal protein, especially, you know, animal protein having a lot more uh, leucine as one of its amino acids. It also has more methionine, but the increased leucine in particular causes it to activate mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin, which is a nutrient sensing pathway. And it also promotes lipid synthesis. So accumulating more fat, more obesity. And there's actually a, a side pathway where the elevated insulin will cause an increase in insulin-like growth factor. And because these two together, increase insulin and insulin-like growth factor, that will also activate mTOR. And so this net effect of activating mTOR is to promote more lipid accumulation, more obesity. So if you see what I'm saying here, you're not going to win optimizing body weight in the long run if you're eating a high fat diet, causing you to make more fat cells and causing you to store more fat uh, by activating mTOR. And you're not going to win eating a lot of animal protein because it's also going to activate mTOR and promote accumulation of lipid. Not only that, mTOR promotes cell replication. So it accelerates the rate at which cells replicate. So it accelerates the rate at which one reaches the Hayflick limit. Hayflick was a microbiologist working with human tissue cultures. And he noticed that 
typical cell culture, you know, non-gonadal, it'll get about, and non-stem cell, it'll get about 60 divisions uh, before it just goes into senescence and dies. And so the point is, you don't want to accelerate cell replication. It also mTOR accelerates cell growth. You know, like if you're a 20 year old bodybuilder, it might help you get bigger, stronger, faster. But if you're over 40, you know, you don't want to get cancer. You don't want to speed up aging. And so you don't want to be increasing mTOR. And so that's what I'm saying is all this animal protein accelerating your aging, accelerating your increased risk of cancer. It's not something that you want. Now, is plant protein completely safe? It has a different amino acid composition, but I do worry about being excessive about it. Now, I know the T. Cole and Campbell studies, they were working with individual proteins, with a gluten protein, with a soy protein, and those did not cause an increase in cancer when they were given up to about 20%. But I still worry if you're eating lots of different forms of plant protein, because then you're not getting that isolated, limited amino acid composition. You're getting a variety of amino acid competitions and potentially are you going to start bumping yourself up over the edge, the threshold, if you will, where you cause more activation of mTOR? So there's a guy by the name of James Mitchell, PhD, who has lectures, and he recommends minimizing total protein intake as much as you can. So that's a little bit of a, excuse me, that's a little bit of a separate subject, but I just keep that in mind. Yes, I still do eat some beans, but I don't want to overdo it with my protein. And as I get older, I think I'll probably drift towards eating fewer beans. I kind of like the beans because I got such a long satisfaction of hunger effect. And I can eat the OMAD diet, one meal a day diet. So I only have to eat once a day, which is convenient for me while I'm working. And it saves me about an hour of time each day. It gives me a little more time to sleep, et cetera. Okay, starch is a complex calorie. It's low caloric density. It stretches your stomach with few calories. So you get early satisfaction, hunger, early satiety. That will then decrease your ghrelin. And then it's slowly absorbed from the gut because it takes time for the, the gut to pull the fiber off the food. So you get a slow absorption of glucose. So you get the slowly rising blood glucose curve. And that's what you want. It's like a slow release energy pill, if you will, versus you don't want simple sugars because they spike your glucose fast. I don't know if you can see my mouse. I'm trying to draw those curves with the mouse. We're basically made for eating starches and it's very good to eat you know, your vegetables. And I think fruits are, are, are not as bad as people say that fructose problem is more of a problem with artificially sweetened drinks, you know, like a sweetened beverage where there's no fiber um, and there's no other antioxidants or other food stuff. So you absorb it too fast. Um, so these are obesogenic foods. Um, now here is the story on leptin. Leptin, you know, lepto in Greek means thin. It kind of makes you thinner. It comes from lipid, your fat cells. The fatter a person is, the more leptin they make. And the way I think of it is like a fuel gauge for the amount of fat stored in the body. It determines a set point. The set point is higher in, on a high fat diet and a high meat diet. Um, leptin lowers appetite. So that's why it's, you know, to be thin. It's a satiety hormone. It does have to travel from the fat cells to cross the blood brain barrier and it goes to the brain hypothalamus at the arcuate nucleus. And it normally exerts an effect to decrease insulin synthesis and secretion from the pancreas. Um, vegans have lower leptin, leptin levels in persons who eat more meat and whatnot. Carnivores have higher ones. But the big problem is leptin resistance that occurs when eating a high fat diet. Um, and hyperinsulinemia also contributes to lowering that leptin level. Uh, ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. So if the leptin can't cross the blood-brain barrier, the, ba the brain cannot interact with it. And the brain, in a sense, thinks it's starving. So that's kind of what I, the way it works is in our ancestors that they never were going to be able to eat high-fat meals three times a day. So having high fat in the blood on a around-the-clock basis confuses the brain, confuses our metabolic system. And we paradoxically almost think we're starving and we overeat. Um, and that's not just my theory. That's actually the theory too, that comes from guys like a, a version of that, you know, guys like Gerald Shulman. He's like one of the best, uh, diabetes researchers in the world. Okay. Ghrelin. Uh, we talked about ghrelin and G for ghrelin, G for gastric comes from the stomach. It's not as important. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about insulin because most things that cause fat, cause obesity, cause increased insulin. So the big one is the high fat diets, the most common uh, risk factor, important one. And we talked about how it lowers blood brain barrier permeability to leptin. And so therefore your set point is going to be set higher. It's going to just make you, you know, trend to always wanting to be at a fatter body weight. Um, we talked about how high insulin raises insulin like growth factor. The reason it raises, it raises insulin like growth factors because it blocks the production of insulin like growth factor binding protein in the liver. So then you'll have the ILGF being more free to be active. And of course they activate mTOR. 
And what I'm trying to show here is that when you eat these animal foods, processed foods, high fat foods, you just have not one thing pushing you towards being fat, but multiple things pushing you towards being fat. And that's why it's almost inevitable. Most people become fat when they eat that way, just because it, it shifts your entire metabolism. Um, it was kind of like, you know, when I studied, you know, animal protein and high fat diets, do, do they increase the risk of cancer? They didn't increase the risk of cancer in one way. They did it in over 30 ways. And what I'm basically saying here is high fat diets don't just make you fat in one way. They make you fat in multiple ways. They're high caloric density. They cause hyperinsulinemia. They activate mTOR. They reset your set point with leptin. These are all major problems predisposing to obesity. In addition, hyperinsulinemia causes increased activation of the sympathetic autonomic nervous system, sort of the stress system, which leads to elevated cortisol. So that will also contribute to more obesity. Cortisol has what's called a mineralocorticoid uh, property whereby it increases sodium reabsorption from the kidney. So you're going to have higher sodium. You're going to be more predisposed to hypertension. The catecholamines can also have an effect to increase hypertension. Uh, by the way, the ectopic fat theory um, was largely one of the major describers of that is Gerald Shulman. He won the Banting Award as the best diabetes researcher in 2004. His video is actually available on the internet. If you just go to YouTube, you can watch his lecture. It's a great lecture. It's one of the best lectures ever on diabetes. Um, and he talked about that idea of fat. So the, the route, and he also was worked with Roy Taylor. Oh, here's Roy Taylor. He won the Banting Award in 2018. He's in England. He came and visited Shulman over at Yale and they were working with nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy to show that the first identifiable finding in diabetes was the accumulation of fat within the skeletal muscle cell. Okay. Coming from a high fat diet. And that's what I'm thinking of those Tadahumara. The reason it might've taken them two weeks is took that long for their, their skeletal muscle perhaps to be accumulating uh, fat. Okay, where does blood glucose come from after meal? For about six hours from the meal. Glycogen breakdown for about the next 24 hours. And then gluconeogenesis starts contributing to about 12 hours. But it lasts easily till 48 hours. That's one of the reasons why I'm perfectly comfortable with an OMAD diet, one meal a day diet, because your liver can maintain your blood glucose pretty well for about 48 hours. So to do it for one day is pretty easy. I don't get hungry. I feel good. Maybe it's because of the beans. On my day off, I'll typically eat two, twice a day, but... Okay, uh, causes of insulin resistance. Okay, these are relevant because anything that causes insulin resistance causes um, obesity. So we talk about excessive dietary fat, especially saturated fat. Obesity itself will release fat into the blood, cause insulin resistance. Being sedentary increases the risk of insulin resistance because normally when you exercise, you get more glucose to go into the skeletal muscle. It has the same effect as insulin in a sense that it causes the cytoplasm uh, vesicles, uh, glucose type four transporters to merge with the plasma membrane of the skeletal muscle cell so they can bring glucose into the skeletal muscle cell. So exercise is, is your friend in a big way um, to prevent insulin resistance. Excessive stress, elevated cortisol, we talked about that. Oh, and also the vegan diet helps improve a person's mood. It makes them less anxious. And there's reasons for that because when you're eating whole plant foods, you avoid all those excitotoxins in processed food, um, the MSG, the, the GP, et cetera. And that'll decrease your stress. Um, stress equivalents, things like sleep deprivation, caffeine, corticosteroid medications, they all ele elevate cortisol, cause increased insulin resistance. Dietary fructose is tricky. Now, I would put them in two different categories. There's a category in fruit, which is relatively small amounts packaged with fiber, and that helps to slow down absorption significantly, versus industrial fructose, such as you'll drink in a sweetened beverage where you get this rapid high bolus of fructose. And that's bad. I'll explain why I have a diagram of the, of the biochemistry of it, but that predisposes to uh, fat accumulation in the liver. It also produces a lot of uric acid, so it can worsen gout, but uric acid does more than worsen gout. It's also, it also has an inhibitory effect on endothelial nitric oxide synthase, and that is going to cause insulin resistance. Okay. Um, in addition, it's now thought that uric acid is what's called a bridging molecule, like LDL cholesterol. It helps stick red blood cells together. So it predisposes you to atherosclerosis. It makes your blood more prothrombotic, predisposed to clotting. And atherosclerosis is actually a blood clot. Trust me, I did a fellowship with emphasis on vascular disease at Harvard, you know, about 25 years ago, and I've been studying atherosclerosis for a long time. Once you, you study atherosclerosis in an advanced way, you recognize it is a blood clot. And that's not just my opinion. That's the opinion of the best researchers in the world. Dr. Gregory Sloop and uh, Dr. William Roberts, et cetera. There's very good reasons why I say that. Okay, artificial sweeteners, they also do more than one thing, but one of the things they do is they can trick the pancreas. The sweet taste in one's mouth and digestive tract can trick the pancreas into releasing more insulin than it should, 
And the excessive release of insulin leads to downregulation of insulin receptor activity in the cells, which can have an insulin resistance-like effect. Uh, so I recommend avoid artificial sweeteners. The more you avoid processed food, the better off you will be. Um, excessive dietary sodium. It inhibits endothelial nitric oxide. One of the ways that uh, postprandial phase after eating delivers more glucose to the skeletal muscle is by causing vasodilation in the skeletal muscle. So anything that inhibits endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which is the enzyme that makes nitric oxide the vasodilator in skeletal muscles, what that means is you can't open up the blood supply to the muscle. You can't open up all those little arterial channels. So you can't get the glucose into the skeletal muscle fast enough. Normally, you want to put about 80% of your postprandial glucose into your skeletal muscle. And if you can't dilate those small arteries, arterioles, and capillaries in your uh, skeletal muscle, you can't, get the, you can't get the glucose in there. And it remains elevated in the blood for a prolonged amount of time and to a higher extent. That's a real important point because our diet tends to be very high in sodium and very low in potassium. And that's exactly the opposite of a plant-based diet. Um, with a plant-based diet, you have high potassium, which is a vasodilator. You have high magnesium, which is a vasodilator, okay? Whereas with a processed food diet and a meat diet, people tend to have very high sodiums, which is a vasoconstrictor. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is when you eat a plant-based diet, you basically get everything to go the way it should. You open up the arteries in your skeletal muscle. Your postprandial glucose can be dropped off to your skeletal muscle, put into glycogen where it belongs. Your blood glucose comes down to normal rapidly. Everything is good versus when you eat these high fat diets, you cause insulin resistance. Your blood glucose sticks around in the blood too long. And when you have high levels of blood glucose, there are cells in your body which are not insulin dependent for glucose uptake. Like, let's say your retinal cells, okay, your kidney cells, your peripheral nerve cells. And that's how you get diabetic neuropathy, diabetic retinopathy, uh, microvascular disease. Uh, because those cells are overwhelmed by the chronic prolonged high blood glucose levels. And you also get more glycation, more advanced glycation end products, more hemoglobin A1C elevation. Okay, so what's the implication of this slide? Um, things that cause insulin resistance cause obesity. And by eating a whole food, low fat plant diet, you basically avoid all this stuff. Because So that's why you want to do it. So you don't just improve in one way. This is like 10 different ways right here. Because that's one of the things you'll see. You'll hear all these amazing improvements in health after somebody starts eating low fat, whole food, plant-based. And that's why, because you're actually correcting numerous things simultaneously. And this was just um, from a paper here by Anthony Jay and James Hamilton in 2020. And what they showed was when they inhibited the CD36 fatty acid transporters, it really didn't make much difference for how much fat was getting into the skeletal muscle. And the point of this was postprandial fat and even you know fat release from uh, fatty tissue uh, free fatty acids in the blood, it's able to get into the skeletal muscle. And it appears to have what's called a flip-flop mechanism of entry into the skeletal muscle cytoplasm. And that's relevant because excessive fatty acid entry into the skeletal muscle, it overwhelms the mitochondrial electron transport, and it actually causes it to reverse direction. We'll, we'll come to that a little bit later here. But what am I saying is there's nothing you could do about this. There's no way to inhibit this from happening other than to reduce your dietary fat. So if you want to improve your insulin sensitivity, which is a good thing to do, you have to reduce your dietary fat. Okay, here's the, con the concept of carbohydrate tolerance. What this means is if you just eat a starch meal, you get a little rise in your blood glucose, it'll gradually come down, everything's fine, everything's in a good location. But if you eat fat first, the fat will cause insulin resistance. And then when you follow that by the carbohydrate, you get a much higher and a more prolonged elevation of blood glucose level. So this is called uh, carbohydrate intolerance due to the initial meal of fat. So this is another reason why the fat predisposes you to, to diabetes, insulin resistance, and all the problems that go with it, you know, obesity and whatnot. Okay. And here's a staging system that I sort of created myself. I didn't, you know, invent it or discover it. I just summarized what was in the literature. First of all, you accumulate fat in your subcutaneous tissues and your visceral fat. Then you accumulate fat in your skeletal muscle. This causes insulin resistance in the skeletal muscle. So right after eating, you can't get the glucose in the skeletal muscle. And that will cause postprandial after eating hyperglycemia, high blood glucose. Eventually, you start accumulating more and more of this fat in the liver. And so once you get fatty liver, that's like diabetes of the liver. And that makes the liver unable to sense insulin correctly. So you have insulin resistance in the liver. And that will cause the liver to be releasing more fat into the blood. It'll keep the liver running gluconeogenesis even during fasting when you don't need to. So you're going to get a fasting high blood glucose and so not just postprandial after eating, but also a fasting high blood glucose with this fatty liver. And as the blood levels 
excuse me, tend to be chronically elevated, one will then also have accumulation of fat in the pancreas. Accumulation of fat in the pancreas will over time lead to beta cell failure. And then the person will have lost the ability to make enough insulin and they will be insulin dependent. And I can also tell you, if you look at CAT scans, you'll often see a very atrophic pancreas that has been replaced by fat. Now there's more than one mechanism of pancreas failure. So right here, we're talking about uh, fatty acid accumulation causing pancreas failure of the beta cells. The beta cells are the ones that make insulin um, and how the pancreas just goes into atrophy. Sometimes early on, at least, the pancreas is more likely to recover. It's almost as if it was hibernating, if you will, and it can start to function again. But the longer it goes on, the more chronic uh, it is, the more likely the pancreas will go into complete failure. And I see these, you can ask any radiologist, they see atrophic fatty pancreases all the time, every day. There's tons and tons of diabetic people. Okay, and then all the complications of diabetes, you know, you go blind or you know, most of them die from heart disease, kidney failure as well contributes, they're impotent, they get their toes amputated. It's a terrible disease. And the average diabetic, in my experience, they think they're doing okay. They say, oh, it's under control, it's under control. But actually, it's not. They're, they're sick. Okay, um, fructose. What's the deal with fructose? Fructose is tricky. It's sweeter than glucose, makes stuff taste good. High fructose corn syrup claims that it only has 55%. They've actually tested, I got the paper here, it often has 65% fructose. That's a lot of fructose. So the companies like that um, because it makes their stuff taste good. This lady right here, Dr. Renee Joy Default, she wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Meal. She actually quit her job to focus on fructose because she was so concerned by finding mercury contamination in the high fructose corn syrup because it's prepared with a, a mercury chloralkali uh, processing uh, system that would allow mercury to get into the food. And she said that it almost seemed like the fact there was mercury in the food was liked by uh, some of these processed food companies because it's a preservative. Mercury is put in a lot of things as a preservative. It used to be put into, for example, contact lenses. They call it thimerosal. Um, okay, so that's that's a problem. Uh, let's see. Liver, when, when it enters, the, the liver is the spot where all the fructose goes. After you eat a meal, glucose goes everywhere in your body. Every cell in your body loves glucose, can do stuff with it. Okay, especially your brain wants that glucose. It's not like that with fructose. It goes to the liver for processing. Most of it goes to the liver. And I'm going to show you how it bypasses regulation. And that's why when you have a big bolus of it, a lot of it goes into fat, which is what you don't want. And fructose will cause overeating. Um, and the reason it does it is because it's not going to raise blood glucose much. It doesn't have that much of a glycemic index. So insulin doesn't come up too much. And leptin doesn't come up much initially. And because of that, it doesn't cause satisfaction of hunger. Uh, we talked about how uric acid gets all the value. It gets phosphorylated initially, uh, like fructose 1-phosphate, and then that ATP goes to ADP, and it ends up having a waste product of uric acid. Okay, so you get hyperuricemia, high uric acid in the blood, which is prothrombotic and inhibits endothelial nitric oxide. We talked about that, uh, contributing to insulin resistance. All right, so let's see. What is, I'm going to show you. Here's, here's how fructose causes insulin resistance. Here's the paper on it, how dietary fructose does not uh, significantly satisfy hunger. Um, and this is partly why you hear Dr. McDougall saying, satisfy your hunger with starch. You're not going to satisfy it as well with fruits, with the fructose. And this is a, a, the reason why. Um, it'll tend to cause overeating. And I've noticed this, that I could really quickly eat 10 apples and still want to eat more, eat 15 of them. And for some reason, my hunger is not satisfied. But I could never eat that many potatoes. You know, it just takes more. I love potatoes, but it takes more effort to eat them. You can't overeat them so fast. I even wondered if they sprayed MSG on them or something, because how come I can chow down 10, 15 apples super fast and, and keep wanting more versus I can't do that with other foods. Okay, um, so what happened? Like I said, because you're not ele elevating the blood glucose that much, you don't initially get much of a spike in insulin or a spike in leptin. And so you don't get, those are what helps to give you satisfaction and hunger. So you don't get that satiety and that's why it's easy to keep on eating more of them. So here's the paper going through all the biochemistry of it. And now here's another paper showing the fructose biochemistry. And I'll show you, here's the key thing. Fructose goes to the liver from the gut through the portal vein to the liver. And then the big thing is that it gets phosphorylated uh, to fructose 1-phosphate, okay? But this is different than glucose. When glucose enters glycolysis, which is the cytoplasm biochemistry cycle for metabolizing glucose, it has very powerful, tightly controlled regulatory steps. The key enzyme is phosphofructokinase, typically abbreviated PFK. And bottom line is glucose is not going to run through that cycle unless there's a good reason. Let's say the cell's energy charge is low, but it's not like that with fructose. Fructose gets phosphorylated automatically 
and then it enters glycolysis distal to the regulatory steps. It'll enter at the three carbon phase, like uh, glyceraldehyde and a DHEP, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So the point I'm saying is if you drink, you guzzle down one of these fructose sweetened beverages, you can get this giant bolus of fructose and it's going into your liver and it's going to run through glycolysis because there's no regulatory steps on it. And the liver has nothing to do with it. At the end of glycolysis, you get pyruvate. Pyruvate's made to acetyl CoA. And then there's nothing to do with that acetyl CoA except make it into fat. So you get a fatty liver. And then now with the fatty liver, you get insulin resistance in the liver, like diabetes of the liver. And you start going down that whole metabolic cycle towards um, uh, diabetes. Whereas, like I said, the glucose goes everywhere in the body. It's not limited to the liver like fructose is. And every you know spot, especially the brain wants it big time. The muscles take about 80% of it postprandial, stored as glycogen largely. The muscles are like the biggest organ system in the body by far. Okay, so fructose bypasses the regulatory step in glycolysis with the PFK, phosphofructokinase enzyme. You make excess, excessive acetyl-CoA, get stored as fat, causing fatty liver. And it also, the ATP to phosphorylate the fructose, you know, goes from adenosine triphosphate, tri as in three phosphates, to diphosphate as in two phosphates. And then that's further degraded into uric acid. That gets into the blood. And that high uric acid, this is going to cause inhibition of endothelial nitric oxide, blocking vasodilatation association with insulin. What that means is the small arteries in the muscle can't open up to let the insulin help them store glucose. So you're going to cause more insulin resistance there. So in a way, the way I think of this is imagine a bear, it's autumn time and it wants to hibernate soon. It could eat tons and tons of fruits as a way to get fat. And this is a way to make that happen. Um, so fructose is not at all the same as glucose. Here's the paper showing that high fructose corn syrup often had 65% fructose. That's a ton of fructose. Um, and this is, these are other papers comparing, you know, when patients drank fructose sweetened beverages versus glucose sweetened beverages, it was with the fructose, not the glucose, that they got a lot of fatty liver, um, increased blood cholesterol, and especially increased insulin resistance for what we're talking about, leading to increased risk of long-term obesity. Here's the paper showing that high fructose corn syrup was routinely contaminated with mercury. They were made in these chloralkali plants. This lady, Renee Dufault, like I said, she kind of dedicated her life to researching this and wrote a great book about it. This lady, Jane Hightower, wrote an excellent book. She's an internist in the San Francisco Bay Area. And she wrote a book, I think it was called something like Mercury, Diagnosis Mercury. And it was interesting. She had all these yuppies that were demented and nobody knew why these people were cognitively impaired and demented. And they were sent to her and she started checking uh, mercury levels on them. And she found that they were, they were mercury intoxicated. And it turned out they were mercury intoxicated because they wanted to eat fish because they thought that would be good for their health. So she took them off all the fish and their mercury levels dropped real rapidly. I thought that was kind of interesting. It's a good book. Um, oh, and then the processed food companies, they seem to be like the mercury. They would even have, they would advertise high fructose corn syrup as a preservative. It's a preservative because it had mercury in it. Trust me, man. You want The more you learn about preserve, processed food, the more you want to avoid it. It's not your friend. I know it tastes good, but that's because it's got chemicals in there to get you addicted, like substance abuse. Okay. Um, you know, these are just more papers showing when you feed people high fructose instead of glucose, they're going to be predisposed to fatty liver. Okay, uh, fructose enters the liver. We talked about it causing hyperuricemia, that causing insulin resistance because you can't vasodilate the muscle to take up the glucose for glycogen. So it makes you fat. And here's just another paper showing the same thing. I just, I'm including all these papers here so that anybody wants to read more about these subjects on their own, it's all right here. Um, so here it is again, dietary fructose uh, leading to hyperuricemia, inhibiting endothelial nitric oxide synthase, therefore decreased nitric oxide vasodilator in the muscle. Therefore, you can't open up those little arteries so the insulin can't get the glucose into the muscle. Therefore, insulin resistance. Therefore, insulin levels go higher. Higher insulin levels cause more uh, lipid accumulation, more fat storage, more obesity. Um, air pollution tends to cause insulin resistance. And so people who live in areas with a lot of air pollution they're more likely to be fat. Okay, this is showing that sodium inactivates endothelial nitric oxide. So it's doing the same thing as the hyperuricemia by inhibiting endothelial nitric oxide, the vasodilator made in the small arteries by your endothelial cells, that's the lining cells of your arteries. You will thus not be able to open up those small arterioles in your skeletal muscle after eating postprandial. And therefore you can't get that glucose into your skeletal muscle as quickly as you should. And when that glucose hangs around in the blood, it starts going spots where it should not go, which means the cells that don't have the ability to regulate the rate of glucose uptake, your eyes, diabetic retinopathy, your kidneys, 
diabetic nephropathy, your peripheral nerves, diabetic neuropathy, that's all bad. And also insulin resistance affects the brain. We'll come to that later, but it's bad for the brain too. Adding salt to meals, increased risk for type 2 diabetes. Plus salt tastes good. It gets you in the habit of eating more. What you'll find if you reduce dietary salt, you just get used to not having it and you're fine. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, sodium diet. When you decrease the sodium in the diet, the hemoglobin A1Cs come down. So besides getting you to eat more, also inhibiting endothelial nitric oxide are reasons why it contributes to insulin resistance. Now, another question comes up sometimes, well, why is magnesium relevant? Because magnesium is, you know, it's a cation. It's got a, a two plus positive charge. So it can hang on to these negatively charged oxygens. So here's ATP, adenosine triphosphate, triphosphate, one, two, three phosphate. These are powerfully negatively charged and they want to bounce away from each other. The, they're negatively charged. The positive charge of the magnesium holds them together like the second and third phosphates on an ATP molecule. If you don't have that, you can't run these ATP dependent reactions, which is tons of reactions in a cell, including the plasma membrane, sodium, potassium, ATPase. So as usual, like I said, the plant foods solve so many of these problems. Where do you think you get magnesium from? Take a look right here at chlorophyll. Magnesium sits right in the center of chlorophyll. So when you eat plant foods, they've got the chlorophyll and the magnesium sitting right there. Most common nutrient deficiencies are like uh, magnesium deficiency and potassium deficiency and fiber deficiency. Why? Because those all come from plant foods and people don't eat enough plant foods. So that's what I meant by just eating the whole food, low fat plant foods. You solve all these problems simultaneously. And you don't need to be a genius. You don't need to be a big scholar. Just look at all these epi epidemiology communities, these poor persons, many of them illiterate. They just eat plant foods and they're healthy. Okay, it's not rocket science. Um, so magnesium sitting right in the center of chlorophyll and plants are loaded with potassium. You really wanna be eating at least five to one more potassium than sodium. Um, and you know, quite often 10 to one or more, it just happens. Take a look at some nutrient labels and you will see all these whole plant foods when they've got a nutrient label on them, you can look up their ingredients. They'll have routinely 10 to one, 15 to one potassium to sodium. And you know, Dennis Burkett had said, humankind in the modern world is the only animal that eats more sodium than potassium. So it's very easy, just start eating the plant foods. And what, what's happening here, like why are these fat people so bad off? Many of us know fat people. I've known lots of fat people for 20, 30 years. And I can tell you almost none of them ever lose the weight. Most of them are fat forever. They just gradually get worse, fatter and sicker. Um, they stay the same for a long time, but they gradually get fatter and sicker and it's sad. And what I'm saying is I showed you some of these other examples of how the high fat diet increases uh, fat cell hyperplasia causing more fat cells. So that's gonna make it harder to ever lose weight. I'm going to show you some other work from Yamashima's research, the Japanese neuroscientist, on how he believes that the, uh, especially the omega-6 cooking oils are leading to lipid peroxidation and brain damage in the hypothalamus, worsening the hunger center's ability to control our dietary set point, plus it's damaging the pancreas. Um, this right here is just the idea of when you have a magnesium deficiency from not eating the plant foods, you can get yourself into vicious cycles of these self-reinforcing cycles that just make you fatter and fatter and sicker. For example, when you have hyperinsulinemia, you're going to increase the sympathetic autonomic nervous system. Okay, that's going to cause you to have more urinary loss of magnesium. Um, so you're, you're kind of going in a vicious cycle direction. You're losing your vasodilator. Also, it's going to cause increased reabsorption of sodium, your vasoconstrictor. So you can see how the situation just goes from bad to worse. You, you can't win with these foods. Trust me, it just gets worse and worse. And as you get older, you get more fragile. Your body has less reserve capacity to handle these things. This is just a diagram from the same paper on all the ways that uh, magnesium deficiency is harmful to your health. It causes atherosclerosis, vasoconstriction, increases your risk of cardiac arrhythmia. All of these things, they start cycling in the wrong way. So this is what I mean by you have to, you know, climb your way out of the, the pit of, you know, sickness and misery and understanding how you do it is what helps you. And it's like I said, Eat starch, eat your plant foods, stop eating your animal foods, no oils, no sweets, uh, no sofas. All right, so P, remember P for potassium, P for plants. That's your best supply of potassium, okay? Um, and and that's, that's all key to know. And like I showed you, magnesium sitting right in the center of chlorophyll. That's what helps you to become healthy and get your electrolytes the way they should be. Artificial sweeteners, we talked about on tricking the pancreas Here's and causing insulin resistance. Here's the paper on that subject. So you're not going to win with artificial sweeteners. They don't work. They're more likely to make you fat. Okay, um, let's see. The role of mammalian target of rapamycin. So that's mTOR, you know, from the island of Rapa Nui. Okay, it promotes fat storage. mTOR is like a nutrient 
uh, it's a nutrient sensing pathway. It's like a contractor. It basically is waiting to see that there's enough building blocks available. And once it's got that leucine, um, and the, especially this high fat around two, mTOR is activated, tells cells to replicate, speeding you up, heading towards um, accelerated aging, increased cancer risk, increased obesity. Like I said, it promotes uh, mTOR is blocking lipolysis, blocking the breakdown of fats. Um, here's a seesaw showing this is where a lot, most people are eating a high fat diet, the SAD diet, for example. They're worsening obesity, uh, mTOR is activated too often, hyperinsulinemia, elevated insulin like growth factor. They're relatively sedentary. They're exposed to lots of estrogenic chemicals, lots of dietary sodium. All of this stuff is making them fatter and sicker, more hypertensive, more diabetic closing down their arteries with atherosclerosis, predisposing them to impotence, to heart attack, to stroke, versus what you want to be is more of a maintenance mode. You know, you're exercising a reasonable amount. Then you activate this, what's called the AMPK pathway. I sometimes write it AMPK pathway. That means adenosine monophosphate activated protein kinase. Okay, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Complex carbohydrates to keep you in this maintenance phase. You're skinny. You're going to sleep better. You'll have higher melatonin, less cortisol. Um, the love hormone oxytocin is also sort of the opposite of cortisol. And that comes from having a purpose in your life, you know, friends, family, stress management, religion helps some people, all of those things help keep you healthy and resilient. Um, this is just a little bit more about mTOR showing how mTOR, uh, is not your friend, you know, especially mTOR one, there's an mTOR one and mTOR two, but for our purposes, mTOR one is really all that matters. It's much more important. If you want to learn more about mTOR, there's a guy by the name of David Sabatini. He did great research on it. He's got a bunch of videos on the internet. If you want to learn about mTOR, I would start with his videos to watch. Uh, what else? mTOR causes insulin resistance, okay? It's blocking the insulin receptor. So, you know, how much worse could it get? That's what I'm saying is this high animal protein, not only is it increasing your cancer risk, it's increasing your diabetes risk, it's raising your blood cholesterol, and it's accelerating your aging. You don't want that. Um, Talked about mTOR, we talked about animal protein, have a lot more leucine. Methionine is also an essential amino acid and the body can't make it. And that's much more available in meats, for example, and cancer needs that to grow. So that's another way that cancer increases the risk of uh, meat. Animal protein increases the risk of cancer. T. Colin Campbell is the guy who's written most about that. He's very clear on the subject. So how do you lower mTOR activity? Eat a low fat diet, no animal products, minimize dietary fat, exercise more. When you eat a plant-based diet, you automatically lower um, you're risking all those multiple ways. Potatoes are really low in leucine, so they're less likely to activate mTOR. The MPK PK pathway, basically when you exercise, your body has low energy right when you get done with exercising, and that shuts off mTOR. mTOR only wants to grow and replicate when it has an excess of nutrients, high energy. So by exercising every day, look at a lot of these people who survived metastatic cancer, people like Ruth Heydrich, okay? She's running around exercising, doing her marathons and triathlons. She's gonna activate AMPK, so the cell senses its low energy and says, hey, this is not a time for growth and replication. We've got to you know, reestablish our ATP storage. So it prevents the cell from replicating, prevents cancer from growing. Um, insulin and sympathetic nervous system. I talked about the SANS effect. Oh, this is one thing about stress response. Like I said, the initial part of stress, the early fast phase is primarily the catecholamines like norepinephrine, adrenaline. Um, the slower chronic phase is more the cortisol, the bad stuff. So it's normal to have stress now and then, and it helps give us energy before you're going to work out. You want you know, more catecholamines flowing in your blood, but you don't want chronic psychological stress. that kind of drags you down. Um, as far as uh, fats, uh, you've got saturated fat where there's no double bonds. A MUFA is a monounsaturated fat, one double bond. A PUFA is a polyunsaturated fat, meaning it's got multiple double bonds. Palmitic acid, C16, meaning 16 carbons, zero double bonds. Most common saturated fat, usually call it sat fat. This is the hydrophobic component with no charge on it. Here's the polar component where the carboxylic acid is. Um, and that's why it, it's amphiphilic, meaning that it's partly like a frog and amphibian can live on water and land. It has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic components, meaning water loving components and oil loving components. And that becomes relevant for why these fats increase the risk of leaky gut. That's another reason why I wanna reduce dietary fat to minimize diet, uh, leaky gut in these autoimmune diseases. Okay, here's a PUFA. And meaning that there's polyunsaturated fat, more than one double bond, typically a double bond. Like here's an omega-6 fat, meaning it's at the six carbon from the methyl end. And there'll be a carbon in between the double bonds. It doesn't have a double bond on it. And that hydrogen is it's called a methylene group. So that's the methylene bridge. That's the one that's at risk to get plucked off and cause what is called lipid peroxidation. So lipid peroxidation is the hydrogen gets plucked off. 
you got an uh, electron sitting in an unpaired orbital and often uh, oxygen will bind to that. Then it becomes called a peroxyl. That's why it's a lipid that gets the peroxyl group on it, lipid peroxidation. And this will form secondary toxic aldehydes. I'll show you an example of that. And these cause a lot of damage. Oil is a really toxic substance. It's not a human food. You shouldn't eat it at all. Um, so lipid peroxidation occurs with PUFAs. And there's a lot of literature showing the problems with omega-6s. I don't know how much problems happen with omega-3s. I don't know if that's been studied. I'll just show you one paper here where they took, I don't know if this thing is blocking it. I don't know if this thing, microphone thing is blocking it. Omega-3s and omega-6s, they gave them normal conditions for a person who would store them. Like, you know, you put them in the fridge in an opaque bottle because they're so high risk to go rancid on you. And what they were showing is they were undergoing lipid peroxidation just for routine storage and transport. Much worse if you cook them. And so I don't know what the significance is. But that's one reason why I wouldn't want to be taking them because I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's similar problems with the omega-3s. I don't know for sure what they are. I have not studied them, but I'm just saying logically, they got more double bonds typically than a lot of the omega-6s, okay? So they're at risk to undergo the slip peroxidation. This is a typical toxic aldehyde that a lot of research has done on 4 hydroxy nonanol. I kind of drew it out and color-coded it to help you recognize. So here's the aldehyde, the toxic aldehyde. The ene group is a double bond. On the fourth carbon, there's a hydroxy. So you'll hear it typically abbreviated for hydroxy. That's hydroxy group. Non means nine, non for non and all. Okay, ene is for the double bond and it's abbreviated H and E. So there's lots and lots of literature on this, how H and E, a lipid peroxidation product from omega-6 cooking oils, damages mitochondria. It's a tumor promoter. It's also a dementogen. It predisposes you to dementia. So here's one paper on lipid peroxidation products. Yamashima did a lot of research on this. This is now coming from the work of Dr. Yamashima. He's a Japanese neuroscientist. He was you know, tasked with trying to figure out why so many more Japanese are becoming demented than used to be the case. And he figured it out that he thought the main contributor was these omega-6 cooking oils. That was what was happening was they would undergo lipid peroxidation to produce this H&E, which we just talked about. And the H&E would get into the brain neurons and it would cleave what is called a heat shock protein. These heat shock proteins, HSPs, they have important jobs inside these neurons. They transport uh, dysfunctional proteins to the lysosome to be digested. They also bind here, these little green circles bind to the lysosome, this blue uh, vesicle here, and they stabilize its membrane. Because the lysosome is like a, a pool of acid, if you will. And if it leaks out, it'll destroy the cell and kill the cell. And that's exactly what happens with these H&Es. They cause the, H, the heat shock protein to be cleaved. It can no longer protect the lysosome. Lysosome leaks, and it's um, proteolytic enzymes digest the cell. And so in the memory center of the hippocampus, that causes dementia. Uh, brain damage, and you know you can't remember anything. And then it also goes to the hypothalamus and has a slow, gradual effect of, of killing hypothalamic neurons, making people fatter. And he believes that's also contributing to diabetes. And he thinks that's why people who eat a lot of fried food have more diabetes, that it's a mechanism of injury to the pancreatic beta cells. So here's a picture of mitochondria. You know, there's an outer mitochondrial membrane, there's intermembranous space, inner mitochondrial membrane, and the mitochondrial matrix here. Um, this is an electron transport. We're not going to have much time to go into details of electron transport, but basically the electrons are passed along here. Protons are pumped in the membrane space. It creates a proton gradient, and the gradient is harvested by letting a proton come back in, and that energy is used to add a phosphate to make ATP. And that's how most energy is made in the cell. You can make 18 times as much energy with the mitochondria than you can in the cytoplasm with just glycolysis. Okay, if you have excessive amount of electron leak, dropping down into these oxygens, causing superoxides. Normally, you can, you can neutralize those quite well. Superoxide just mutates here. But if you have an overwhelming amount of them, they'll undergo lipid peroxidation and damage the plasma membranes, damage the uh, mitochondrial membranes, especially something called CL for cardiolipin. So what does that? High-fat diet will damage this electron transport system. And there's actually other things that will do it, including hydroxynonanol. And atrazine is also toxic to this electron transport chain. So these are things that are going to predispose you to insulin resistance. And what I'm also saying, some of these things you can't avoid. They might be in the foods or chemicals you're exposed to, but you certainly want to minimize this. Okay, um, so here was the work of Yamashima. That's his name, Tetsumori Yamashima, Japanese neuroscientist. And like he said, the omega-6 oils already have it when you buy them. They get it worse in storage. They get it worse in cooking. More and more lipid peroxidation, more and more production of these uh, toxic aldehydes like hydroxynonanol. And initially he did his work in, it was especially the patients who had deficiency of acid aldehyde dehydrogenase like enzymes, why some uh, Asian persons can't handle alcohol as well, they get flushing and whatnot. Those were the persons most predisposed to, um, 
dementia because they lacked adequate amounts of the enzymes to process these toxic aldehydes. And that's partly why they couldn't tolerate alcohol. But in healthy mice and monkeys, he was showing similar problems with lipid peroxidation from eating omega-6 fats, causing brain damage and pancreas damage, okay? This is the dementing problem. If you damage the hippocampus, memory part of the brain, and the hypothalamus, the hunger center, was being damaged as well, okay? So this is the work of Yamashima. Here's one of his papers, if anybody wants to look that up. Here's some slides from his papers. These are dead neurons in the hypothalamus. So what he's basically saying is the hypothalamic hunger center, part of it in the arcuate nucleus, is damaged by lipid peroxidation of omega-6 cooking oils. And as, as you gradually damage this over time, the person might have more difficulty in the future of ever reestablishing their ability to control their hunger. And that might contribute. I think a lot of these people, people I know that are fat for decades, they've just given up on themselves. They just say, well, this is my fate. I'm a fat person. There's nothing I could do about it. I'm just going to enjoy my food while I'm alive. Okay, um, here's hippocampal neurons being destroyed in a similar way. You know, a normal neuron should be well outlined. You can see the nucleus clearly. The cytoplasm is distinct from the surrounding tissue versus here. You see how it's sort of fading into oblivion. These are neurons damaged by lipid peroxidation from hydroxynonanol from eating omega-6 oils or, or for his experiments with them. So here's his paper again, Tetsumori Yamashima. If you want, you can look that up. He, he wrote a book about this as well. Um, Beta cells of the pancreas are inherently uh, low in their antioxidants and they're more at risk for this. And he's saying that something similar is happening in pancreas beta cells. And this was my guess and his guess as to why perhaps people who eat a lot of fried food, which I think is more common in persons of Indian descent, that might be why they have more diabetes. Because I was kind of amazed when I first heard that. Um, so we talked enough about all this Tetsumori stuff. Oh, when, one of my rules is the more profitable a disease is to manage, the less likely a cure will ever be discovered. Um, I'm going to get to a graft a little in a little while that's going to be good to, to go back to Yamashima's idea. Real quick, though, here's Roy Taylor. He's the English physician who worked with Shulman out at Yale with the nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy showing that fat accumulation in skeletal muscle was the first indicator of uh, insulin resistance. Like I said, you can watch that entire video on YouTube. And his group also was using, so that's nuclear magnetism, magnetic resonance spectroscopy for individual chemicals. This is MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, for looking at the entire liver, liver at once. And they would look at the liver and at the pancreas, and they could see how much fat is in it. And basically, as you start accumulating fat in the liver, you get insulin resistance in the liver. And that means it can't shut off gluconeogenesis. It can't accurately regulate blood glucose. It makes too much glucose to be sent into the blood. And then when you accumulate fat in the pancreas located right here, you will then get pancreas failure. The beta cells will fail. And I tell you, I see this all the time. Atrophic pancreas replaced by fat, typical in an old diabetic. I looked at the scans. Any radiologist will tell you, oh, yeah, I've seen lots of atrophic pancreases. They probably won't know that that's associated with end-stage diabetes, but it is. They can look it up pretty easily. Okay. Um, and this guy, Roy Taylor, he also showed that if he got these patients within four years of their diagnosis of type 2 diabetes to minimize their dietary fat, it was routine that he could reverse their diabetes, okay? And he, he calls it a twin cycle theory, meaning that first there's a cycle of accumulating fat in the liver, and then the second cycle in his description is accumulation of fat in the pancreas itself, okay? Um, so these are just more ways to more precisely quantify it. Other thing is you'll see a drift up in the ALT enzyme. This is from your liver function test, ALT right here, as they're gradually heading into becoming diabetic, and their blood glucose is going to just start going straight up again like that hockey stick curve once they hit this point. So that progressive gradual uh, worsening liver disease from fatty liver is an indicator that they're heading into loss of their pancreas function. So it's important to take that seriously. Fatty, fatty liver is so common that it's part of a standard macro for any radiologist to dictate an ultrasound of the liver. It's almost always a fatty liver. You get a, a history that says elevated LFT, liver function test. It's almost always a fatty liver. It's routine to look at kidneys. It's part of the macro for dictating a kidney ultrasound incidentally noted as a fatty liver. It is a super, super common disease. So this is from the Roy Taylor paper again. And he, by the way, won the Banting Award is the best diabetes researcher in the world. Yeah, this is, he says, here's the intake in your mouth. He describes it being like handlebars on a bicycle, all this fat accumulating in the liver and the liver starts shunting out more fat into the blood then the fat accumulates in the pancreas. So as the liver accumulates fat, it goes into liver insulin resistance, inability to regulate blood glucose level, fat accumulates in the pancreas, Fatty accumulation in the pancreas leads to pancreatic failure. Initially, it might be reversible. With time, it becomes irreversible. You just get a fat replacement of your pancreas. Like pancreatic head is routine to see it replaced by fat in these old diabetics. So your best chance to reverse this process, very low fat, whole food, plant-based diet. Okay. Um, 
let's see. So how to prevent beta cell dysfunction? Like we said, no oil, no meat. And I would say no processed food, exercise a lot. Um, Roy Taylor, he's got a lot of videos on YouTube too. You can watch him. Um, and like I said, fat and skeletal muscles. I had a great quote of his. I think, oh, I think it was maybe on that previous slide. He basically says, diabetes is a disease of fat. Everybody thinks it's a sugar disease, you know, a disease of glucose, carbohydrates. No, it is a disease of fat storage. Okay, that's what causes the insulin resistance. All right. Okay, now what was I saying is, is it like an approach for the individual? How do you turn this all around? The biggest thing you can do in one fell swoop, like David against Goliath, is to just go whole food, low fat, plant based diet. Okay, and that's been shown by tons of people. Dr. Esselstyn's work, Dr. McDougall, Kempner, Pritigan, you name it, Chef AJ, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, that is well known. Okay, here's a nice quote by Doug Lyle, the psychologist. He said, less than 5% of the population is able to find out and learn about the vegan diet motivated to to do it and then to stick with it okay so not this is kind of a very small group of people that are interested in all this but it's the truth it's what works also i gave the description here that your hunger drive is overpowering it's like hannibal when he was crushing the romans okay there was nothing they could do against him he conquered like sixty thousand romans easily in one battle everybody in rome was scared of hannibal what could they do to, to handle him and they got this guy named quintus fabius maximus the delayer was his nickname and what he basically did, he said, you could never win against Hannibal head to head, the Carthaginian. And so you have to have a bunch of little small strategies. And what that means to me is like all these little things, like eat your veggies first, like, like Chef Asia says, veggies for breakfast, eat a smaller bowl, low caloric density. All these little things add up to help make you able to handle the issue with your hunger drive. You're not going to beat it head to head. But we talked about, too, reducing your dietary fat, you reduce your insulin. These are all these like miniature strategies that you add on top of going whole food plant-based that will help you to optimize your body weight. Okay. So he saved Rome. He was the hero who saved Rome. So you can be the hero to yourself, save yourself from fat. Okay. And then the last thing I go into is what I would call the, like, how do you get rid of all these obesogens? These obesogen chemicals, they're everywhere. And in my opinion, this was Napoleon. He was going to kick, he was going to kick Russia's butt. And the Russians almost used a scorcher's policy where they, they avoided giving the Napoleon anything to eat. So Napoleon's army was starving. And that's what you want to do. You want to avoid all of these obesogens with this minimalist approach. So if like, for example, if you go into my bathroom, there's nothing there. There's one bar of soap. That's it. It's the simplest, transparent, fewest bar of soap ingredients. No shampoo, no chemicals, nothing. You go into my wife's bathroom, there's 55 cosmetic products. Okay. So what I'm saying is when you got all these cosmetic products, each one of them is going to have estrogenic chemicals in them. You got to filter your water. There's tons of estrogens in your water. Um, avoid your food estrogens. We talked about those before. Personal products and just sort of being aware of these things. And the meat diet causes a lot more estrogen effect. So the reason I'm telling you that is you could try everything, but if you're exposed to real high levels of estrogen, you're going to be predisposed to gain weight. And these are estrogenic chemicals. There's a whole bunch of them. There's lists of them. Um, okay, what's the healthiest foods? These, eat these low fat starches in particular when you're starting out. Potatoes, rice, and sweet potatoes, they're all in the ballpark of 1% fat. You minimize dietary fat, you will be have a much, much better chance of losing weight. Okay. Sweet potatoes, I think, are the healthiest food in the world because not only are they super low fat, they're also really low in protein. And that helps you to minimize your, your overall dietary protein. Now, I know people say you can eat as much plant protein as you want. I'm not so sure about that for reasons I alluded to earlier. But that's as good as it gets. Look at the people of Papua New Guinea. They get like 93% of their calories from sweet potatoes. They're really robust and healthy, even though they smoke a lot. Um, the Okinawans used to eat a lot more sweet potatoes in their, in their healthiest days. Nowadays, they're eating more fast food. They're getting fatter and sicker like everybody else. I like beans, but they're kind of high in protein. I have a concern about that long term. Okay, fruits. I, this is just a little bit of a defense of fruits. You know, like I said, a lot of these athletic people eat a lot of fruits and they're pretty healthy. The rest of us got to be a little more careful unless we're exercising enough. And again, the fruits come packaged in a healthy way, unlike um, the sweetened beverages with the high fructose corn syrup and all that. Um, so like I said, I'm just gonna show you there are a lot of positives to fruits. Uh, briefly, we talked about Kempner before. He had the public effect of people had to weigh in in public, but Kempner's you know, results were awesome, but they were still sort of largely people had to travel to Durham. People don't wanna have to travel. They would often gain the weight back when they went home, but he did have incredible results. And I just want to show you his diet. Oh, it's kind of cut off from the screen. It's below the screen where I can show it. But his patients were eating like somewhere in the ballpark of about 93% carbohydrate and only in the ballpark of, I forget it was about, you know, 4% protein and something similar for fat, 3% fat, incredibly low numbers. 
Okay, here's what the paper I'm from Kempner, Walter Kempner's paper. Newborg was a doc who worked with him. She wrote a really nice biography of him. It's a good book if you want to read about Dr. Kempner. Um, he had a whole bunch of patients. They go, have you ever had anybody lose 100 pounds of weight? He goes, yeah, here's 106 of them. Um, he took care of about 19,000 patients. All his literature is over at the drmcdougall.com website as well if you want to read his papers. Um, they're quite amazing, actually. Okay, lots of patients reverse their diabetic hypertensive retinopathies. Um, congestive heart failures are often reversed. EKG findings reversed. Tons of hypertensive reversed. Kidney functions improved. It's, it's extraordinary to read it. It really is. Okay, um, this lady, Jean Renfro, she wrote a book about her uh, visits to Kempner. And uh, she had all these funny words. It was going to pilgrimage uh, to Kempner. He was the Wizard of Oz. Uh, it's kind of funny. She has a lot of funny little comments in there. Okay. Um, I was going to show you a little bit of stuff about atherosclerosis. I don't know how we're doing for time. About how much time do I got left? Well, I can't hear you. Sorry, sorry. I turned my volume off so that you get better sound. You have 55 minutes, but we would like you to answer a few questions if possible. You have almost an hour, Dr. Rogers. Okay. So I got a little bit of time. Keep going here. Yeah. All right. Uh, so thanks. Um, when you eat high fat foods, it causes the red blood cells to stick together. That's called rouleau as in rouleau formation, the French word for a stack of coins. Typical red blood cell, it's about five microns and five microns you have to go through. The red blood cell is about seven microns. The capillary is about five microns in diameter. So the red blood cell, the RBC has to deform to pass through there. When you've got the high LDL cholesterol sticking them together, the RBCs can't deform so well. So it takes higher blood pressure to push them through. And that's one of the main reasons why a high fat diet causes hypertension. Um, the red blood cells have something called a zeta potential, meaning a negative charge on their outer surface. And it's because they have these sialic acid uh, residues, which are negatively charged. The sialic acid is pretty much like a glucose with a carboxylic acid on it. There's a negative charge from the carboxylic acid. Excuse me. So that negative charge repels other red blood cells. And that's what you want. You don't want the red blood cells sticking together so they can independently move and deform and deliver their oxygen. There's bridging molecules like LDL cholesterol, also uric acid, which we talked about before being elevated when you have a lot of, excuse me, fructose. Fibrinogen gets elevated when you're stressed out, it's an acute phase reactant from the liver. Also IgM antibodies can be elevated with an acute infection. All of these things stick red blood cells together and increase the risk of uh, blood clotting. I'm going to hold my other arm here. Okay. Um, so this is showing the zeta potential. This one, all this graph, it got a little distorted, but the gist of it was the higher your LDL, the higher your blood viscosity, the more thick your blood. So the higher blood pressure is going to be. This next paper comes from the uh, work of uh, Peter Kuo, a cardiologist in Pennsylvania. And he showed that by checking a patient's uh, blood lipids every 30 minutes after feeding them a high fat meal, they would get peak lipemia around five hours. And the patients, these are patients, he was a cardiologist, known coronary artery angina. They would get coronary angina symptoms, most commonly right at peak lipemia. And then there was the big push in the 1960s. Oh, well, we can't have all the sat fat like Ansel Keys showed. Sat fat was bad. Let's feed them all these cooking oils, these omega-6 cooking oils, for example. And what he found was they were even worse. They called them more, they caused them more prolonged lipemia. It's been also shown they're tumor promoters. And so the, his ex experimental researchers really didn't like this because the patients would still be hyperlipidemic late in the afternoon. They all wanted to go home. And then similar research was done subsequently by Meyer Friedman and Ray Rosenman working as ophthalmologists looking at the eye. They could put a microscope, 80 magnification over the eye, and they could see in real time small arterioles occluding. So it's almost frightening. Usually they would reopen up later. But the point I'm saying is high fat meals are bad for blood flow and they'll decrease oxygen about 15 to 20% in oxygen delivery. You increase the risk of, you know, an artery thrombosing off. It's not your friend. When you're hypertensive, when, uh, when the left ventricle contracts, it pushes blood into the ascending thoracic aorta and then it, it is expanded outward. The elastic fibers in the wall of the ascending thoracic aorta will then recall inward during diastole, which is cardiac relaxation, and that maintains diastolic flow. So what am I saying? When somebody's chronically hypertensive, <clears throat> they're going to chronically overstretch this ascending thoracic aorta. That ability to, to stretch and then elastically recoil is called the Winkessel effect. And so if you chronically are hypertensive, you're going to destroy your elastic fibers in your ascending thoracic aorta, and it becomes more difficult to ever reverse the hypertension. In order to maintain adequate blood flow to the brain, in particular, the systolic pressure is going to have to be higher when there's no significant diastolic component. So that is called a loss of the Wien-Kessel effect. That's why if you look at people over 50 at their hypertension, 
they're much less likely to have diastolic hypertension because they don't have elastic fibers in their ascending thoracic aorta. They've lost their Winkessel effect. You cannot replace these elastic fibers in the ascending thoracic aorta after the age of about your early 20s. So it becomes irreversible. And this is also part of why everybody looks good to about 35 years of age, but the people with bad habits, they start to age much more rapidly. They trash their Winkessel effect and they're starting to lose their endothelial nitric oxide capacity, their endothelial precursor cells, all these things. So, you know, by having all these good habits, getting your sleep, getting your exercise, eating the whole food plant-based diet, you'll hang on to your bodily reserves and you'll age better. You'll be less fragile. Okay, normal blood flow should be like this, a parabolic velocity profile, red blood cells in the center, white blood cells adjacent, and then the plasma on the outer margin, okay? And the higher your blood pressure, like when you've got a high fat meal, it's gonna be more hypertension. It's gonna hit these uh, bifurcation median ridge dividers. Here's a bifurcation of the external carotid artery, internal carotid artery. Internal carotid goes up to the brain, external carotid artery goes to your face. So the blood comes here and it hits the median divider of soft tissues. It'll bounce off that. There's always going to be some turbulent flow. There's always going to be some retrograde flow of the blood. But when it hits at a higher speed, <clears throat> you will get more turbulent flow. You will get more retrograde flow. And the retrograde flow also sometimes called eddy currents. And it's very slow. And it confuses the endothelial lining cells of the arteries at this location. And they sense it as a potential arterial injury. And the endothelial lining cells will start to express prothrombotic molecules and it predisposes to forming a blood clot. One of the things that I do is I'm a neuroradiologist, so I've looked at thousands of these CT angiograms of the brain. I also was gonna be a neurointerventionist, endovascular brain surgeon at one time in my training, but I didn't continue down that path. But the point I'm saying is, I spent a long time studying atherosclerosis, looking at it, not just reading about it in papers, looking at tons and tons of catheter arteriograms, magnetic resonance imaging arteriograms, CAT scan arteriograms, CT angiograms, and I'm telling you, it looks like a blood clot. And that's what it is. It's sitting right there on the far wall away from the median divider. And normally we can kind of keep it under control. We have a steady state removal of the clot, reabsorption of the clot with our endothelial precursor cells covering it over, our macrophages removing it. But as people get older and more thrombotic of a tendency, they'll be more likely to progress and gradually stenose or occlude this artery or to let little tiny particles uh, break off and embolize distally to the brain and cause strokes. Pretty common thing that I see you know, loss of vision in one eye, amaurosis fugax. That's a transient loss of vision from break off of those uh, little particles. Okay, here's your uh, endothelial cell. And your endothelial cell, this drawing is kind of not displaying correctly, but they're spindle shaped, along, orientated along the long axis in the direction of flow. And when the flow is turbulent, it confuses them. They got little cilia-like receptors, mechanoreceptors that sense flow direction. And if there's too much turbulent flow, too much retrograde flow, they start to express prothrombotic molecules on their cell surface. Normally, they've got antithrombotic, things like antithrombin-3 and heparin sulfate, which have a negative charge on them, producing an endothelial zeta potential with a negative charge, thus to repel red blood cells, for example. They'll also release nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is the vasodilator. So this is a happy, healthy endothelial cell. Like I said, when you eat sodium, you inhibit this nitric oxide production. And Dr. Esselstyn talks about this all the time. Excessive saturated fat will inhibit nitric oxide production, okay? If you're deficient in your potassium and in your magnesium. You cannot run these, um, these enzyme systems adequately and you'd be predisposed to thrombosis, uh, hyperinsulinemia and atherosclerosis progression, arterial occlusion. Okay, so endothelium, it all depends on making that nitric oxide. I've talked about this in other lectures. I, have a, I had a lecture with Chef AJ about atherosclerosis, how atherosclerosis can be reabsorbed partially. You can reabsorb the lipid core, the necrotic core, uh, part of the fibrous tissue, but not the acellular component. You can't reabsorb the calcification, but the endothelial cells will start making nitric oxide again. So you can often get dramatic improvement upon switching to, let's say, an Esselstyn diet, you know, a very low-fat plant-based diet. One interesting too is there's sort of a different pattern of atherosclerosis in, let's say, Japanese population. They sometimes call it Asian atherosclerosis in the sense that they're eating a low-fat diet with a rice-based diet back in the old days, but they were eating tons of sodium, like 14 grams a day. And they would get hypertension from that. And they get this intracranial atherosclerosis. Whereas a typical high fat diet, more of a Western diet, if you will, they'll tend to get, first of all, a lot of coronary artery disease, heart disease, and they'll get a lot of carotid atherosclerosis. Okay. And if a person's eating, you know, both of these things, lots and lots of sodium, uh, and they're also eating uh, lots of fat, they're going to get both of these patterns of atherosclerosis. And here's, the, here's the, the slide that I wanted to show you earlier. So the American diet, very high in fat very highly predisposed to atherosclerosis and kind of alluded to, oh crap, I don't know how to get out of that. Oh, I got back to it. All right, so what I wanted to show you was 
because I was kind of amazed. Most of the Indian persons I know are my male doctor friends, and they're skinny and healthy, energetic, everything. They're fine. But it turns out that population of the Indian diet with a lot of fried food, they got lots of diabetes, much higher than one would expect. I think it's because they eat so much fried food. And I'm just guessing, I think they probably are having like a Yamashima effect of lipid peroxidation leading to loss of pancreatic beta cells. That's what he believes is the cause. And it seems reasonable to me because I don't know what else, how to explain it. Um, we talked about the, uh, the East Asian Japanese high sodium diets causing hypertension and a lot of strokes. Um, and then how do you win? And then the American diet, you know, being high in fat, a lot of coronary artery disease, cerebral vascular atherosclerosis, mostly from the carotid, but a lot, you know, moderate amount of diabetes. So here it's becoming a lot. Um, low fat, low sodium, you know, very low fat, low sodium, whole food plant-based diet. You don't get any of this stuff. I mean, there's, there's like nothing in medicine as obvious as this. Like I said, the Yanomamo, zero hypertension, zero obesity. You're not going to get a better deal in life and health than this. I mean, it's just good to know it exists. And don't be tricked out of it, okay? It's your life. And I'm just showing you, it doesn't get any better than this. Okay, and at the same time, you, you lower your risk of cancer because the things that activate mTOR, we talked about that, the high-fat diets and the high-animal protein diets, they also increase your risk of cancer promotion, okay? And, and death, okay? It's not good. And the hyperinsulinemia, the diabetes, it immune suppresses you. So it increases your risk of infection. You don't want that. And the high-fat diets also increase your risk of leaky gut and autoimmune disease. It's all bad. I kind of call my version of the diet the Spartan vegan diet, you know, as a former wrestler. And it, my diet's really simple. It's real boring. Most people don't like it. So you're going to want more variety. So, yeah, I'm not the guy to go to for variety advice. Um, potato and rice, like I said, really, you know, this isn't displaying correctly. I had them lined up nicely on my regular initial set of slides. But these really low-fat foods, they're going to help you become skinny. I remember Chef AJ's lecture. She couldn't lose weight when she was eating the high-fat foods like the avocados and the nuts. And then she started eating the potatoes and she started losing the weight more effectively, okay? And like Dr. McDougall says, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Look how much fat there is, let's say in just in salmon. It's 50-50 food, 50% protein and 50% fat. So it's bad with animal protein and it's bad with fat, okay? There's tons of fat, okay? And even if you get a so-called low fat meat, the lowest of the low fat, you know, in the ballpark of 25% fat, that's still a ton of fat. I want my dietary fat 10% or less. Okay, I think mine's significantly less than that. All right, so the beans, there's different types of beans, but an average for a bean overall be about 4% uh, on the fat and about 25% on the protein, but beans do vary. Um, here's a little more detailed description of how much fat's in food. This is another reason why I'm not a big fan of soy. It's about 40% fat. I'm not a fan of flaxseed. It's about 71% fat. Look at these nuts. Some of them, they're varying from 71% to 90% fat. That's a lot of fat. You know, McDougall, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Uh, your dietary fat predisposing you towards increased risk of obesity, increased risk of insulin resistance eventually, even if it doesn't cause so much initially. If you've got less saturated fat, for example, you still get obese, and that's going to predispose you to hyperinsulinemia and increased risk of diabetes. So I don't think that's a good path to go down, just as my opinion for what that's worth. It's not my opinion. That's based on my study of the literature and a lot of uh, effort to understand it. Um, you know, let's say of the, of the more healthier plant foods, you know, even oatmeal has got about 16% fat, quinoa about 14% fat, which is reasonable. I still eat oatmeal like on a weekend in the daytime. I like to eat oatmeal earlier in the day because it's such a wet food, if you will. You don't want to eat that at night. You're going to have to wake up the void. Um, garbanzo beans are a little fatter than the other beans, but they're still good beans, about 13%. I like lentils, especially. They're only about 3% fat. Okay. Fruits are real low in fat. They're real low in protein. So those are some other advantages of fruits, some of the things I like about them. We talk about white rice, potatoes, and sweet potatoes are your trifecta of super low-fat starches. Those are great foods to keep you skinny. And you've all heard and seen the Asian populations back in the old days, before 1970, everybody was skinny. You know, like Dr. McDougall says, like a billion out of a billion. Look at a Bruce Lee movie. All the extras are skinny except for Bolo, and I'm going to bet you he was taking steroids. Um, olive oil comes up. A lot of people love olive oil. I've got Greek friends. And if I say anything negative about olive oil, I look like they, they, they don't want to, you know, they're, they, they're sad and mad at me at the same time. You know, in the, in the Odysseus, the Odyssey, the old Greek uh, book, you know, they, they built their bed around an olive tree. That's how much Greek people love olives. So you can't criticize it around them. Um, olive oil has got all kinds of problems. It's almost boring to go into it. I've given separate lectures on the subject, but it's like one of the most overrated foods. It gets so much great advertising like look at that name extra virgin olive oil as if you know like you're lucky to have a chance to have some of that there's a comparison of the lion leone heart study with esselstyn 
Esselstyn's diet had about 40 times better outcomes. I mean, it's not even close um, in fewer, you know, cardiovascular events. Um, there's been other studies here. The Blankenhorn study was good. Basically, to lower your risk of atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease, you have to reduce your total fat intake, okay? It didn't matter which one it was. Sat fat, mupa, pufa, they were all atherogenic, right? Okay, this is just showing you how to count the carbons and stuff through the fatty acid terminology if you care about that thing. ALA is the most common thing, let's say you'll find in flax. So that's going to have uh, three double bonds. But again, three double bonds, you got to increase risk of lipid peroxidation in comparison with sat fats have almost no lipid peroxidation. A MUFA has relatively little. Oleic acid is sort of the main component of olive oil. But olive oil also contains some uh, sat fat and some omega-6 fat. Arachidonic acid is sort of the big one with four double bonds. And then here's EPA and DHA. Those are your fish oil uh, versions. And I don't like that idea of fish oil because to me, here's what I say to myself. Look at all these double bonds. EPA has got five double bonds. DHA had six double bonds. And, and so let me see. Let me just tap here in front of me. So you tell me it was six double bonds. You think you're going to avoid lipid peroxidation? I doubt it. Imagine that's for a, Antarctica cold water fish. You're now going to put it you know, in your room temperature room and your 98.6 degree body, and you don't think you're going to get lipid peroxidation? I doubt it. So the point again in this paper, especially the blank and you got to reduce your total dietary fat to reverse atherosclerosis. And once you do that, there's been a lot of papers showing you can reverse atherosclerosis, including in animal studies and human studies, et cetera. Okay, this was just a paper. It got messed up because I'm do looking at this on a different computer than I made it. But the bottom line was you get plenty of omega-3s and omega-6s just from eating plant foods. You don't need to supplement. And I had some Pritikin quotes attached to the slide that are being hidden from it. And he said, there's no such thing as a fat deficiency. McDougal said he's never seen a fat deficiency patient in his life. I've never seen one. Um, and there were studies. One was the Winnett study. Another one was the McKean study, where they fed patients for a prolonged amount of time, diets with less than 1% fat, 0.7% fat. It was primarily omega-6 fat. And the patients were fine. So we really don't need much fat. Like I said, Kempner fed his patients hardly any fat. They were fine. So all this stuff, you need more fat, you need more fat. I don't believe it. In my opinion, the nutrition literature does not support that conclusion. And I also, I told you, we don't need much protein either. You know, Dr. McDougal talks about, you know, milk having about 5% protein. And I've read other papers about 6% protein, whatever, 5 to 6% protein. And that's the time as your baby, your most rapid growth. Rest of your life, you're not going to have that rapid of a growth. You don't need that much protein. And I've seen papers where people have done well on 2.5% protein. So what I'm saying is it's impossible to be too low on a natural occurring diet in protein or in fat. And, you know, McDougall will tell you, you've never seen a case of calcium deficiency either. And these are the things that everybody worries about. Oh, I got to get my calcium, my protein, my good fats. That's not the problem. You're low in potassium and magnesium and fiber, which comes from plant foods. That other stuff don't matter. The Bantu ladies who, you know, they don't have any problems. They don't get hardly any calcium. All right. Um, okay, more problems with fish oil supplements that can cause immunosuppression. They can increase cancer risk, prostate cancer in particular. So we talked about that before, but the big thing I kind of wanted to get out, one of the key points to get from this lecture today is you get yourself into a negative self-reinforcing vicious cycle from all this processed foods, these estrogenic chemicals, and these high fat diets that you just get fatter and fatter and you can't turn around. The increased body fat will make more aromatase enzyme, which makes more estrogenic hormone, which makes you fatter. So you get this whole negative cycle doing. So the way to sort of break the cycle is to minimize your dietary fat and then get the other benefits of the plant foods, the magnesium, the potassium, the fiber, the antioxidants and whatnot. You don't get those from meat or processed food in any type of adequate amount. Um, we talked about stress suppressing your immune system, increasing your cancer risk, increasing your risk of diabetes. So these are just a couple of papers to that effect, showing that effect of stress. Uh, this was the effect of social, report, social support. I love this painting because, you know, here's a poor old guy, like the father of the family, and he's a paralytic, uh, his legs aren't working. And whole families, you know, helps take care of them and helps them survive. And what I mean in a lesser sense, that's how having a good social support system helps any individual. You know, humans are a social animal. We all depend on helping each other. So I just thought this was a beautiful painting. It's called Filial Piety, the Paralytic, uh, Jean, Jean Baptiste Grusa. Okay. Um, okay. So what's this? Now, sympathetic activation and obese mice, the role of brain insulin. Okay. So high fat diet will increase sympathetics, that'll cause more hypertension, that'll increase cortisol contributing to obesity, the increased cortisol tends to contribute to insomnia. But I think one of the key points here is obesity will decrease transport of insulin across the blood-brain barrier. So what this means is you're going to have less ability for insulin to act upon the brain. And everybody knows, oh, the brain, it's got glucose type 1 and glucose type 3, 
transporters of glucose that are not insulin dependent. Yeah, that's true. But they forget to mention it's now been proven, it's well demonstrated. There are glucose type four transporters in your brain cells, including in your hippocampus, okay? Meaning that they need insulin to be able to obtain adequate amounts of glucose. So when you are insulin resistant in your brain cells, you cannot get enough oxygen into your brain cells. And that's a big problem in your hippocampus. Because you've heard me talk about neurovascular uncoupling, where you've got a metabolic demand of the neuron relative to blood supply. And I, I can't let go of this. I got this like earbud thing in from like, my microphone computer wasn't working. So you got you want to keep your metabolic demand, oxygen, glucose supply close. If they get too far apart, you're not going to be able to meet the metabolic demands of the neuron. So what I'm saying is your brain neurons are starving in the midst of plenty. You got this big fat patient with all these lipids in their blood and they got glucose in their blood that's high from their diabetes, but they can't get it into their brain cells because they can't get this insulin to their brain cells across their blood brain barrier. So their neurons are screwed because the neurons cannot adequately burn fat. They're not designed to burn fat. They don't handle beta oxygen, beta oxidation well of fatty acids. So uh, I have separate lectures on this and I gave one with Chef AJ, my one about dementia. You get neurovascular uncoupling and it's a progressive, I can tell you diabetes patients are some of the most cognitively impaired people I ever talked to. You know, I'm like, you know, they're getting their foot chopped off and I'm like, you know, you might want to fix your diet or you're at risk to lose your other foot. And they always say, oh, at my age, what are you going to do? I'm taking the pills. It's under control. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's not. They just sort of fade into oblivion like those neurons in the Yamashima paper. It's sad. Okay, hyperinsulinemia with insulin resistance. What else is the cause? We talked about all this before. These are just more papers so you can read about it. And what I'm saying here is you can't win with fat. You get stuck in this cycle of obesity, activation of hyperinsulinemia, activation of mTOR, rapid arrival at the hayflick limit, increased risk of cancer growth on the mTOR, increased accumulation of fat from the hyperinsulinemia and the mTOR. You're just screwed, okay? So it's all here. You can read about it for yourself, but just don't understand why. There's a good reason to say why this is not good. Oh, here's something I find that's kind of funny. All these people tell me how much they love coffee. Tons of doctors drink coffee, PhD scientists. I used to drink coffee for about 15 years. I had two cups a day. But then I started to study and they're like, oh my God, I can't believe I, I drank this stuff for all those years. In this particular paper, the caffeine was reducing cerebral blood flow by an average of 27%. And it's worse than that. Not only are you reducing cerebral blood flow from a vasoconstrictive effect, you're simultaneously also increasing metabolic demand because it increases, it mimics stress. So that causes increased release of glutamate neurotransmitter across the synaptic junction in your hippocampal neurons, your memory center. But what does that mean? It's an excitatory neurotransmitter. The metabolic demand of that neuron is increased. So does that sound like a screw job or not? You drop the blood supply while you simultaneously ramp up the metabolic rate. That's bad. And if you superimpose upon that hyperinsulinemia with insulin resistance, now you're dropping the glucose that can get to that neuron. Throw some sodium into the meal. Now you're vasoconstricting that neuron, dropping its blood supply even further. Let's say you're a sleep apnea patient. You're, you're hypoventilating at night. You're dropping your oxygen delivery to that poor neuron. Okay. Let's say you're a diabetic. They used to check their blood sugar three times in a day with a needle stick. Nowadays, they can uh, get those continuous uh, glucose monitors all through the night and they'll get a printout. They're dropping their blood glucose at night. They maybe gave themselves too much insulin. You see how you're screwing over the neuron? You're increasing the metabolic demand while dropping blood supply, meaning dropping oxygen and glucose delivery, vasoconstricting the arteries. That's why people are losing brain cells and they're becoming demented and cognitively impaired and stupid and it's sad. I see tons of cognitively impaired people, tons of them. I look at the charts all the time. I can tell you 95% of the time, They've got diabetes and or hypertension. Most of them, I'd say probably about 90%. They've also got, they've got both hypertension and diabetes. And I can also tell you, they routinely have cataract surgery very often, more often than not than my demented patients in both eyes, okay? And they typically have poor dentition. They're all manifestations of a sad diet. Okay, a little more on caffeine if you want to read about it. It basically just mimics the acute stress response. Okay, and how do you quit? You do a gradual taper. If you want to read the slide, it'll give you the details. Like for example, how I quit it and whatnot. And I don't recommend tea either. I know a lot of people think tea is so great. It has a tendency to concentrate things, you know, that you don't want. Fluoride, aluminum, potentially lead. You can read the Mike, Ad Mike Adams book on food forensic. He'll talk about this. I don't know how common lead is, but you got to be careful with all that stuff. Um, I took a, I had a botany class in when I was in college at Stanford, and I was an evolutionary biology major. And my professor said, "Watch out for these teas. A lot of times, nobody really knows what's in them with all these ingredients. You got to be careful what you're ingesting." Okay, this is just, again, sort of the pattern of diabetes. Accumulate fat subcutaneous, then you accumulate it in the muscle. The muscle becomes insulin resistance, early phase of diabetes. Liver accumulates fat, liver becomes insulin resistance. Then the pancreas accumulates fat and the pancreas fails. Insulin resistance in the muscle causes postprandial hyperglycemia. Insulin, fat accumulation in the liver causes fasting hyperglycemia because the liver can no longer regulate blood glucose and it just keeps running gluconeogenesis, the production of more glucose and releasing into the blood even when it shouldn't. And the pancreas finally 
keels over and dies after a couple of decades. So that's diabetes. And how do you stop the whole process? Stop eating all that fat. Get the plant foods. Get your uh, potassium. Get your magnesium. Minimize your sodium. And then avoid all these obesogenic chemicals. So fatty livers, like becoming the most common cause, it's becoming a very common cause now of liver transplantation. It's a disaster. It's so common. I expect the liver to be fatty. I'm surprised when I don't have a fatty liver. Um, I look at lots of liver ultrasounds, for example, kidney ultrasounds, CT scans of the abdomen, see tons and tons of fatty liver. Okay, um, the only fats, good fats are fiber fats. So what I mean by this is when you eat fiber, it's taken by the bacteria in the colon and it's converted into short chain fatty acids. And they're usually one carbon, I'm sorry, two carbon, like the acetate, three carbon, the propionate, and the four carbons, the butyrate. The butyrates are used to maintain the intestinal lining and prevent leaky gut. Like about two thirds of the energy of the colon lining cells is from that butyrate. And then the acetate, the propionate, they go up to the liver. The two carbon acetates used to make even numbered fatty acids, the three carbon propionate to make odd number of chains on your fatty acids. Those are relatively uncommon. Palmitate, you know, C16 is the most common. But what I'm trying to say is the fiber is providing you with some good fat. And I think that's the secret of why somebody will say, well, how could a person survive on potatoes alone? I don't believe it. 1% fat. That can't be true. And what I'm saying is the fiber from the food also ends up being partly made into fat. Okay. So there's more fat than one would expect from just that 1% typical fat description of it. Um, and that's why I also meant by the only good fat, in my opinion, is fiber fat. Nathan Pritikin was famous for saying fat is bad. Because the more you study fat, the more problems you see with it. And like, like I kind of alluded to earlier in this talk. Okay, so these are all the things that fat causes. It'll increase your risk of leaky gut because I showed you the structure of it. It's amphiphilic, meaning that it can sort of intercalate into the gut lining and cause leaky gut, which can lead to postprandial meat-related endotoxemia. It's a topic for a separate lecture. Um, it's going to make your blood thick. Blood sludge is one way to describe the low formation, in particular with LDL cholesterol, causing all this hypertension, cascade insulin resistance. Uh, it can also disrupt the blood-brain barrier when it's chronically present in excessive amounts, can disrupt neuronal function for that reason. Um, increased risk of dementia, I kind of talked about that. Uh, we talked about the problems with omega-6 fats, the whole Yamashima data on lipid peroxidation, toxicaldehydes, HNE, and damage potentially to the hippocampus, hypothalamus, and the pancreas. Uh, omega-3 supplements have been associated with increased risk of prostate cancer. So this is stuff is good to know because I can tell you it's one of the most common questions I get. Well, what about, don't I need more omega-3 fats? Isn't olive oil good? I get these questions all the time. Um, and what I've seen is basically any profitable food, profitable food adopts its own, it gets its own mythology of all its benefits. And so I recommend avoiding all these things. You know, avocados are a seasonal thing, only available for a couple of weeks in nature. Okay, now if you're really skinny and otherwise healthy, it's not such a big deal to eat this stuff, but a lot of us, we're worried about being fat. So we can't handle those extra calories. Um, and you can convert enough of the ALA, uh, alpha linolenic acid, into EPA and DHA as your body needs. We don't need as much as you think. It's like, can you remember anything from your childhood? The reason you can remember your childhood is because those neurons haven't changed. So what I'm saying is they don't turn over as much as people thought. So you don't need as much EPA and DHA uh, as people thought. And your body can make the amount that it needs. Okay, this is just, again, a reminder of the diabetes, skeletal muscle being overwhelmed with fat getting into the cytoplasm because it can't regulate it. It's not through a transporter, just across the membrane, flip-flop uh, mechanism. And here's also when a person's fat, insulin causes the buildup of more fat. The fat starts to leak fatty acids into the blood. So just being fat is going to predispose you to being hyperlipidemic. And then you get all the secondary problems with that, like causing insulin resistance, et cetera. And once you get that diabetes cascade going, there's a whole bunch of bad things that happen. Increased advanced glycation end products, especially from methyl glyoxide. You run all of these secondary pathways. They're all bad. Okay, the unifying theory of diabetes. If you if you want to read about the pathophysiology of diabetes, this is the best paper I've ever written on diabetes. I've read like hundreds of papers on diabetes. This is the best one. Michael Banting, I'm sorry, Michael Brownlee, the guy's a genius. He won the Banting Award in 2004. If you go to the American Diabetic Association site, you can watch the video. You have to sign in though. Um, but you can read the paper for free without having to sign into anything. Trust me, it's the best paper. And he'll emphasize especially secondary effects of diabetes in the setting of hyperglycemia. But he'll then say in the second part of the paper, and this is also what happens initially from hyperlipidemia. It's sort of like he doesn't want to emphasize the hyperlipidemia, but it's there in the paper. And it's a beautiful paper. And it shows how it causes reversal of electron transport. So that's like, it's a genius paper. It's, it's so beautiful. It's, it's an AO. Um, okay, so what do we learn? You got to minimize dietary fat. You guys know what AO means, right? Academic orgasm. Okay. Um, fat deficient diets don't exist. Pritikin. 
Okay, we talked about concentration dependent lipid in the blood gets into the skeletal muscle. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about obesogenic chemicals, estrogenic chemicals. So basically, all these estrogenic chemicals and having high, high levels of estrogen, they predispose to all these diseases you think of as typically being diseases that women get. Okay, they have increased incidence of hypothyroid. That can be largely autoimmune, like Hashimoto's and Graves. But where do you get that from? Leaky gut. So you want to prevent leaky gut. Um, you know, breast cancer. Um, you know, the deodorant contributes to that. It's got the parabenzoic acid preservatives. Those are estrogenic. It's got aluminum and metalloestrogen. The lymphatics are shared between the breast and the upper outer quadrant. Breast cancer in the upper outer quadrant used to be about 25%. Now it's about 60%. And that's thought due to more use of armpit deodorant. You don't need armpit deodorant. You know, when we walk in a room, you say, hey, how you doing? We don't sniff each other's armpits. I think it's just conformist uh, to use deodorant. You don't need it. No one cares. Um, fibrocystic disease is, is predisposed by high estrogen levels. Fibroid tumors. I know I know women, like I said, they, they told me every single woman in their family had to get hysterectomy at a young age because of fibroids. And what I'm saying is it's because they eat meat, raises estrogen levels. It's got estrogen in it. And it causes more estrogen reabsorption from the gut. Uh, they drink tap water, which has got a lot of estrogen in it. So uh, that's a very common problem. Fibroids of the uterus, benign tumor of the uterus um, can cause excessive bleeding at menses. Uh, endometriosis is a common problem. These estrogenic chemicals increase the risk of endometriosis. Um, I give separate lectures on that. Endometrial uterus cancer. Well, it's the same thing as like the breast. It's, it's estrogen sensitive, estrogen proliferation. That's one definition of an estrogenic chemical is it causes uh, endometrial proliferation. Um, heavy menses, uh, post, uh, it, it causes all of these problems. And you know, birth control pill is EE2, ethyl estradiol, which causes a lack of ovulation. It's like telling the body it's pregnant. When a body's told it's pregnant, it also stores more body weight, so it makes a person get fat in, in the thought that the baby might need that extra weight. So it's predisposed to get fat, causes problems with the babies. Um, and here's the deal with estrogen chemistry. It's based on a cholesterol backbone, four cyclic rings, A, B, C, D rings. Hydroxyl group comes off the A ring, and that's what interacts primarily with the estrogen receptor. Um, this component here, the benzene ring having three double bonds and a cyclohexane is like a benzene ring. It's called aromatic because it has a smell to it. And the hydroxyl group right here um, combined with the benzene ring is called a phenol. It's a great preserve. That's why it's in everything, and it's never going to go away. It's always going to be there because it has great shelf life stability. And it's antimicrobial. So mold doesn't grow in your cosmetic product, your moisturizer or whatever. And here's the classic example, bisphenol A and all the plastics, you know, it has a phenol group, the benzene ring with the hydroxyl group. And then people got annoyed. They said, oh, bisphenol A is too dangerous. It shouldn't be in all these baby bottles and all these other things. They go, the companies go, fine, we're going to ban bisphenol A. Yes, we're listening to our consumer. It's a joke. They just put something else in the center, like a sulfate, and it's still going to have a phenol group on it. It's still going to be estrogenic. So you're never, the companies are never going to change. So forget about you can't change other people. You can't change the world. All you can do is change yourself. So don't be ignorant. You know, these things are estrogenic, so you have to avoid them. Um, so basically, here's the same thing. The benzene ring with hydroxyl group, it forms a hydrogen bond with the estrogen receptor. And the estrogen receptor, you know, historically, evolutionarily, ancestrally, didn't have any competition. So anything with this benzene ring and hydroxyl group, it's going to activate this estrogen receptor. Variable amounts, of course, but still, you can, you can identify a, com a chemical as being estrogenic that's got the phenol group on it. Um, and because it's not a type bond, a lot of things can do it. Here's what happens in the liver. When you eat meat, there's basically two types of gut flora. There's the meat and processed food gut flora. And there is also the type of gut flora that you get from eating plant food. Plant food has lots of fiber and it creates a healthy gut flora. We've been symbiotically co-evolved with plants for all our thousands of years or however many years it's been. And so for the plant bacteria, we are like living in our colon is a good apartment for them. They want us to be healthy. Symbiosis means mutually beneficial. But for the meat and the processed food bacteria, they haven't lived in our in our colon that long. They don't really care if we live or die. And they change it, they cause a change in the gut flora. So when you talk about microbiome, there's two main types. There's plant microbiome and there's processed food and meat microbiome. The plant and processed food microbiome has more of an enzyme called glucuronidase. Normally, when we have high estrogens in our blood, our liver detoxifies them. It will conjugate them with a glucuronic acid, which is like a glucose with a carboxylic acid on it, and it'll attach to this estrogen and it'll be excreted into the bile. And then we normally poop it out. And that's how we lower our estrogen level. But the bad bacteria associated with the meat diet and the processed food diet, it'll deconjugate this estrogen and it'll get reabsorbed in the blood. So the blood levels of estrogen will be higher. So that's why a person who eats a lot of meat and has this bad uh, and a lot of processed food, they're going to have higher estrogen levels. That's why. Okay. <clears throat> now, here's the other thing, too. All these estrogenic chemical exposures, including your tap water, municipal water filtration doesn't remove all these estrogenic chemicals. You can easily remove them at home with a carbon filter. Easy. Carbon filter will do it. Um, uh, I like to have reverse osmosis in the kitchen. I have a whole house carbon filter. I think that's a good way to go. But anyways, 
these estrogenic chemicals, they can be present in your blood in super high amounts in thousands of picograms per milliliter versus normal estrogen levels for a woman. They vary between 20 to 400 picograms, you know, depending on what, where she is in her menstrual cycle. So 20 to 400 picograms. In a man, they usually stay at around 20 picograms per milliliter. All right. And like I said, in comparison with some of these estrogenic chemicals, they can get up in the thousands. So even if the estrogenic chemical is a weaker activator of the estrogen receptor, they can be present in such high amounts that they can have a very significant effect. And I think that these are making people fatter, uh, increasing the risk of breast cancer, uterine cancer, and infertility. Um, here's a guy again, Bloomberg, who sort of coined the term obesogens. And the point of this paper is just showing a mechanism to detect effect on PPAR gamma receptor. So the PPAR gamma receptor is, they sometimes call it the fat switch. You know, Anthony Jay, the PhD biochemist, he calls it the fat switch. And the estrogenic chemicals tend to activate this PPAR gamma receptor, which predisposes to obesity. So you'll hear that a lot. It's a fancy name. That's the abbreviation for peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma. So PPAR gamma is kind of a, a, a more difficult than it needs to be named, but just so you've heard it, because you're going to see that if you start reading about estrogen chemistry. And all you got to know is it's in almost all of these things. So my approach is just be a minimalist. Like I said, I don't have any of this stuff in my bathroom. I don't have, I don't have any need for these chemicals. So many people, you know, everybody's scared of spiders and snakes, but most people are not scared of chemicals. You should be scared of chemicals. There are a lot of them are toxic. We're not made for these things. Our body doesn't have as good a defense against them. So this is just a nomenclature for parabenzoic acids. I've talked about this previously in my lecture about estrogenic chemicals. This is just a list of some of the more common estrogenic chemicals. There are tons of them. They're in every soap and detergent. That's why you want to minimize stuff. If you don't cook with oils, you don't even need dishwasher detergent in my experience. I hate the oils and it gets on everything. Everything is all slimy in the kitchen. And I got to wash my hands with soap after I eat because I don't want my hands slimed before I touch a book or a computer. So I don't, I don't like any of that oil stuff. I just rinse my bowl out. I never even used a dishwasher until I got married, you know, and then I, then you sort of got to like do what the whole rest of the family does. They're cooking with oils and stuff. I like being a minimalist. And one of the things I think about a minimalist, I heard this great quote. It said that uh, resources are the enemy of creativity. And what that meant was the more you distract yourself with all these minor fancy things, the less time you have to focus your energy on what it is you care about the most. And so a lot of times I'm obsessively focused on something, whatever it might be, you know, writing a book or trying to understand a disease or something. So I want to keep my life as simple as possible to free up time and energy for that other thing. Okay, so this was just showing some of these, um, these uh, cleaning chemicals, uh, non-olphenol. So non again means nine carbons. Phenol group is the benzene ring and the hydroxy group. And that's a typical thing that's in, you know, your detergents. Um, your dishwasher soap. And so like, again, with my laundry, I just uh, run it in hot water and dry it. I don't put any detergent on it because <clears throat> the detergent typically you got estrogenic chemicals in the BPA plastic or BPA equivalent. Then you've got phthalates, a uh, plastic conditioner. Then the they mix with the soap, which will be a variation on nonophenol. That's three estrogens in your laundry detergent. And then those little squares to prevent wrinkles that you throw in the dryer, those are estrogenic too. So you got four estrogens on your clothes and you're absorbing them transdermally all day long. Who needs that? So MJ is uh, estrogenic, by the way. So it's good to know that. Um, all these sunscreens got estrogenic chemicals in them. I don't ever use sunscreen. I think sunscreen's kind of stupid. Everybody thinks, oh, you got to put sunscreen on so you don't get sun cancer. How do you know that sunscreen doesn't make the risk higher? I'm not so sure about that. I avoid it. If I need sun, I just go out in the sun for a little while and I come back inside. Okay. My wife tells me, don't stand in front of the house. You're lowering the property value. I have to go in the backyard, but there's bees in the backyard. So I don't like going to the backyard. So the best time is when she's not home. All right. Um, options. Don't use any sunscreen. Yeah, that's what I do. If you had to use one, inorganic zinc oxide might be the best. Make sure there's no nanoparticles in it. Uh, I don't like chemicals. We talked about that before. All these food dyes, you know, watch out for red, red number 40. Don't feed this stuff to your kids. You're exposing them to these estrogenic chemicals. I think this is part of why kids are confused about their gender nowadays. They're exposed to so many estrogenic chemicals. And so if a kid's confused about that, I would recommend minimizing their exposure to all these estrogenic chemicals and see what's going on with the kid after that. Make sure you filter your water. There's tons of estrogenic chemicals in your water. It's from BPA to phthalates to EE2, tons of them. So you got to have at least a carbon water filter. You're going to expose these things. And the significance being, if you're exposed to all these estrogenic chemicals, they're going to predispose you to increased risk of fibroids, increased risk of obesity, increased risk of diabetes. You don't want that. Probably increased risk of prostate cancer. We talked about that. Some of these plants that have high estrogens, it's because they prevent the animal that eats them from being fertile and less likely to keep eating them. Flax has off the chart estrogen. Soy's got tons of estrogen too compared to all these other foods. It's another reason why I'm not a fan of those foods. 
This is just a paper showing, you know, it's adapted from this paper off the charts, thousands and thousands and thousands of times more than other foods. There's even these cyanogenic like chemicals in flaxseed. I haven't studied this thoroughly, but I just know like, a lot of people that are like in love with flaxseed. They're in love with soy and they think I'm a big jerk because I'm not and I don't care. I believe I'm right. And so that's it. They can do whatever they want. I think they're, they're like a ignorant moth flying into a bright light. They're going to hurt themselves. I don't think it's a wise thing to do. Okay. This is just a biopsy of human fat. And when they biopsy human fat, they then tested the human fat for estrogenic chemicals. And they found tons of them, 19 chemicals, 19 estrogenic chemicals. And they found lots of them routinely when they biopsy people. So you can read the paper if you want. But the point is, these things they store in the fat because they're fat. All these estrogenic chemicals are fat. Estrogen is a fat hormone and it's a fat storage hormone. So it's full and it stores the fat. You can prove it just by biopsying them. Now, corn is super common. It's the most common thing in processed food. And it sprayed all the GMO corn, non-organic. It's sprayed with atrazine, which is a super estrogenic chemical. Okay, it's also a mitochondrial inhibitor. It predisposes to diabetes. Okay, and here's what I thought was funny. They did this one paper and they found 160 uh, fast food items in a row all had uh, corn in them. They were all made out of corn. They were able to test them for the amount of uh, these like stable isotopes, like carbon-13 and this other variation in nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen 15, and they all had corn in them. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, this is junk. You don't want to be eating fast food and processed foods. They're full of fructose. They're probably going to have high fructose corn, so it might have mercury in it, some of them. Okay, atrazine causes mitochondrial dysfunction and insulin resistance. Yeah, just like excessive dietary fat causes reversal of electron transport. Atrazine damages your, your electron transport and your mitochondria, so it's going to cause insulin resistance. All right, that's bad. So you, then you look at their muscles after they've eaten a lot of this astra, atrazine sprayed corn. Their muscles got more fat in them. Here's normal mitochondria. They look like a peanut. Here's the abnormal mitochondria that damage the internal uh, intermitochondrial membrane, the cristae. You got precipitation, you got all this fat. Why would you want to damage your energy production apparatus and increase your risk of diabetes? That'd be it's a stupid thing to do. So I never eat this, you know, processed, non-organic corn made food. It's, it's not good for your health. Um, so this all goes hand in hand. Atrazine, high fat diet. They just work together in high sodium to just give you insulin resistance and uh, diabetes and obesity. Uh, so you're making yourself sick. And it also has a feminization effect. You give this stuff to the frogs and you can turn the young frogs, the males, you can turn them into females. Uh, this is a guy who did a lot of research, Tyrone Hayes. And he got a lot, he got hassled a lot for publishing these papers, but he's like, you know, hey, I got a scholarship to Harvard to try to help people. I'm going to try to help people. And, and, I, and I can also tell you, when people publish papers on, when they first came out with the papers about high fructose corn syrup being routinely contaminated with mercury, producing those chloralkali vats, I had friends that told me they had other friends who published papers on that and they got fired from their jobs. Industry has got tons of money and they can exert tremendous pressure on scientists and doctors who criticize uh, popular industrial products. So you have to be careful what you say about these things. But I'm telling you, you look at the literature, you're being made. Like here's kind of a sad story. You look at these frogs. These frogs are brothers, okay? And one has been feminized by these atrazine chemicals and the, the two brothers are having sex with each other, these frogs. And I don't know if that's doggy style or froggy style, but it doesn't look healthy. Um, and here's just showing atrazine having a, an effect to uh, inhibit mitochondrial function. Um, and again, we said that'll predispose to insulin resistance. So this is all coming from that. So that's another reason why I like to eat organic. I'm a believer in it for that reason. I see people spraying all the stuff on their grass to kill the dandelions. And then they have a dog and the dog comes in the house and goes in their bed. Then they're going to get all that stuff, those chemicals on themselves. Um, and this is just showing it happens in other animals, too. It's not just humans and mice. It's trout. These are just things that are not good for vertebrate animals. OK, mammals, perhaps in particular, but vertebrate animals in general, they're not healthy. And they lower male testosterone. Uh, this is from the story. It's causing lowering of male testosterone. Here is uh, from ultra processed foods causing abnormal decrease in sperm motility. And the more processed food they ate, the worse their sperm motility. Um, Cause a lot of people are sad, you know, they, they can't, they're infertile. And what I'm saying is pay attention to these chemicals. Cause a lot of times they're, they go some ways they tell them they don't understand. MSG also causes infertility. Look at this, MSG causing infertility. So what I'm saying is the routine chemicals, these are things that people are exposed to every day are increasing the risk of infertility and, and reproductive abnormality, okay? Um, here's, other papers all along these lines, these are these are things making them fat, uh, the soy causing distortion in human vaginal epithelium. This researcher, Margaret Agent, did a lot of work on that. Um, and more of these same problems, you know, it's like chemical 
infertility. More sperm counts drop by 40 million sperm per milliliter uh, with persons ingesting these soy products. They make you infertile, okay? They're not healthy. Um, so anyways, um, that's that. And so just on a happier note, uh, some positives. If you, you know, pay attention to this uh, low fat, low sodium, whole food, very low fat diet. This is a painting called The Fountain of Youth by Lucas Cranach. You can, you know, decrease your biological, physiological age as much as possible. You know, we're never going to be 18 anymore, but it's nice to have all your arteries open. Uh, I'm not worried about any of these atherosclerotic. Most of these diseases are nutritional, so you can avoid almost all of them. Dramatically lower your cancer risk. I kind of like this painting here, too. It's one of my favorite landscape paintings. This is Among the Sierra and Nevada Mountains by Albert Beardstad. I think it's just absolutely beautiful. Uh, and I like it because it reminds me of a quote by Marcus Aurelius. We're just finishing up here. Marcus Aurelius said, a man should be like a rocky cliff against which the waves break, but the cliff stands firm. And so I think that's a good way to be. Basically, you're always going to have minor problems, you know, slapping away at your ankles from the waves. And you just, you know, learn to be stoic, know what matters in your life, focus on that and accept the burdens and the tedium that you have to, you know, to live a good life and be a good person. And I love this quote by Ayn Rand. She wrote, art is a concretization of metaphysics. She wrote a magnificent book called The Romantic Manifesto, a real detailed analysis of art and not just literature, but art in general. And what I'm basically saying is by that is one picks what matters in their life. You only have so much time and you try to live the best life you can within the things you care about and understanding who you are and what you are and what's important to you enables you to focus your time on the things you care about and that matter. And when you live a life that's focused on good things, you're happier. Because I've had, I've had people ask me, like my kid says to me, dad, why are you so happy? He says, your life stinks. All you do is work and study. He says, if my life was like yours, I would hate it. And I said, well, this is what I am. I'm a scholar and I'm good at this thing and I like it and it makes me happy. So that's good, okay? And was, so everybody's got their own thing. He's like, well, why don't you go to the beach? I don't want to go to the beach, sit around all day with sunscreen on myself. I hate that stuff. It's all estrogenic. I don't want to be at the beach. I can go outside for 30 minutes, get enough sun. So everybody's got their own style. But what I mean is, you're happy when you do what you feel like you're made to do, you know, and um, Helen Keller is a nice quote. Happiness comes from loyalty to a worthy purpose. So what I'm saying is you eat this healthy way, you live this way, you'll be healthy. You figure out what your priorities are in life and you stick to them. You'll be happy. I like this Schopenhauer quote as well. He says the best source of happiness comes from who the man is. A happy life is impossible. The highest a man can achieve is a heroic life. And what I'm getting at with all this stuff is all of us have sadness and disappointments and frustrations. And you can't change that in life. That's inevitable in life. But if you can keep yourself healthy and focus on the good things and put your energy into that, you can live a very happy, productive, and good life that you enjoy it and it helps other people as well. So it's sort of like devote your life to a good purpose and make it a work of art. And I love all these beautiful paintings. And then you can have more of your life for you and the people around you to like springtime. So this is the beautiful painting, Primavera Springtime from Sandro Botticelli. So anyways, that's it. Wow. Thank, thank you so much. Um, let's, let's stop the screen share. I'll take that off right now. Hey, Dr. Rogers, that was great. Thank you so much. If you don't mind, a few questions were sent in in advance. You did say one thing like, as if we knew it, something called OA in your lecture. I, 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 I didn't know. Oh, AO. AO. So what was that? I, those are academic orgasms, things that are, you know, really like a big insight with a lot of usefulness. Okay, great. That's surprising. Well, Thank you. People are commenting how brilliant you are. It's hard to keep up with you, but let me take the questions that were sent in. This first one is from, I don't say her name, but anyway, she wants to know what percentage of your diet is raw versus cooked and people wonder what you eat in a day. Okay. Yeah. That's an interesting question. Cause I know there's some debate about this in that, you know, the raw foods, some people will say, well, I don't think we had fire when humans first evolved and we probably ate all raw food. All other animals eat all raw food. Therefore, we should probably eat more raw food. Dr. McDougall, who's actually studied the origin of humans quite a bit, he believes that we probably had fire right about from the start that humans existed on this planet. I don't know for sure about that. I haven't studied it in that much detail, but I would say I eat a reasonable, I probably eat about, let me just guess, in the ballpark of about 50 to 60% of my calories from starch. And then probably another 30, 35% from fruits and then the rest from uh, vegetables. So I, these vegetables don't have many calories in them. You know, I eat probably about two salads a day, maybe one salad a day on some days. Um, and maybe I'm eating too much fruit, but I still feel pretty good. I exercise a lot. I'm about 59. I'm totally healthy. I have zero medical problems. I lift weights every week and I, I can go up and down 50 flights of stairs pretty easy. Um, so 
that's what I do. But what do I think as far as raw? I also have seen some extraordinarily healthy people. Ruth Heydrich has moved towards eating more and more raw food, and she's the great multi-decade survivor of metastatic cancer. There's another lady by the name of Janet Murray Wakelin, and she's the one who wrote the book Raw Cures Cancer. And she felt that eating all raw food was tremendously good for her health. Um, she's another ultra marathoner, though. She did an extraordinary thing. She actually ran a marathon every day, 365 marathons in a row, to run in a circle around Australia. Janet Murray Wakelin, extraordinary. So I'm not sure if there's a definite health benefit per se from eating the food raw. People will say, well, if you eat the raw food, you're getting the natural chemicals as they come in nature. Other people will say, well, if you're allergic to something, the denaturing from cooking might decrease your allergy risk. So um, it hasn't been a big issue for me, so I don't worry about it. Um, so if I had, let's say I had cancer, what would I do? I'd probably cut down on my bean intake because I'd want to minimize my protein just because I'm afraid of the high dietary protein, maybe activating mTOR. But other than that, I'm pretty happy with where I'm at and what I'm doing. Thank you. This is from Julie. Dr. Rogers, can you please clarify what the dangers of a waist circumference over 35 inches is for women? Well, I'm not in the habit of measuring waist circumferences, so I can't precisely answer that, but I can just tell you being fat, you predispose yourself to a lot of these diseases, you know, to insulin resistance, the hyperinsulinemia, to worsening cycles of obesity, the diabetes and everything that goes with that. Also, the fatter a person is, the more likely they are to be hypertensive. Hypertension is the number one risk factor for atherosclerosis, number one risk factor for dementia. All these silent strokes I see in the brain, you know, hypertension is the number one risk factor for that. And I worry about not just the hypertension. I spoke about this previously in my dementia lecture with Chef AJ with regard to a lot of times hypertension is overtreated and then you drop the pressure too low. Well, why was the pressure high in the first place? To adequately perfuse your brain, okay? So if you drop the pressure too low, then you drop the oxygen glucose delivery to the brain and you can lose brain cells for that reason. So the smart move, we talked about it before, is optimize your diet so your blood is thinner um, based on diet. And then your body is pretty good at maintaining the pressure you need. If you try to fix it with a pill, you're never going to get a pill as tightly regulated as your hypothalamus and your, you know, your carotid body, carotid sinus, barrel receptor sensors, okay? So the wise move is Fix your, your diet first, and then if you need to supplement with pills, do that. But, you know, do this all in coordination with your doctor, because if you're on antihypertensives and you need to taper them down, you have to do that under doctor's supervision to make it safe. But Thank, Thanks so much. Uh, Roseanne said, Dr. Rogers, can you please comment on the role of psychiatric medication and weight gain, and to what degree can individuals combat this side effect? Well... There's some papers I read that briefly alluded to some of these psychiatric medicines being obesogenic. So I would look up if you're on one that's obesogenic. I also mentioned in this thing, and I've given multiple lectures before on the effect of food on mood. For example, MSG is thought to be an excitotoxin leading to increased glutamate, excitatory neurotransmitter uh, in your brain neurons, like in your hippocampus, for example, which will increase your risk potentially of anxiety. So once you get that out of your diet, you'll, that'll potentially help you to lower your anxiety level. Um, and also when you decrease your insulin resistance in your brain, your brain cells will be better perfused. So some of these things together can help your mood. You also, also have to psychologically figure out your purpose in life, your own personal metaphysics, if, if, if you will, what you care about, what you want to do with the time you got left on this planet, because having a sense of purpose helps a person to be happy. You know, this one guy, this, uh, Watson, the guy who discovered the structure of DNA, he said, an animal is happy when it does what it's meant to do. A horse is happy when it runs. And I think there's truth in that for a human. They're happy when they do what they feel like they were born to do. Um, and so it's like me, I feel happy when I do this uh, nutrition pathophysiology stuff. It makes me happy to study it. It's such a high yield thing. It's the highest yield thing there is in all of medicine. And I'm educated in pretty much all of medicine, all the high tech stuff, all the fancy transcatheter surgeries and stuff. And I can tell you, there is nothing anywhere remotely as powerful in all of medicine than this nutrition and diet stuff and toxicology stuff. And that's why I love studying it and I'm fascinated by it. Um, so anyways, I hope that helps. So like, what would I do if I was in this situation of a patient? I would find out if the, the medication they're taking is obesogenic and I would see if another medicine could be substituted for it. I would see if, you know, by working through all the other options for therapy, if they'd be able to taper off those medicines, if they could, I don't know if it's possible, the longer they've been on an antidepressant, for example, the longer they're gonna, they, the harder it is to come off of it. 
and you can read these other authors who who've written about it. You know, you've had some really good speakers on your channel. I've had about- Dr. I've had a psychiatrist, Dr. Stuart Shipko, and that's what his practice is about getting them off medication. Yeah, and I think that's a good idea because I think those neuropsychopharmaceuticals are much more dangerous than is widely realized. And I think in the long run, most of them predispose to cognitive impairment. And I've actually studied that pretty extensively. Dr. Lyle recommends a wonderful book called Anatomy of an Epidemic. He recommends people read if they're on the drugs. Have you? Are you familiar with it? Yeah, yeah. I think it's by Whitaker. I, I read the Whitaker. book and I watched his video, videos. I was impressed by him. And yep. my study of the subject agrees with him. Yep. And he's been on the show. Uh, Sharon would like to know, is there a particular type of filtered water system that you recommend? Um, well, I like to have what's called an automatic backwash whole house carbon filter. So that means, you know, typically your water for municipal water filtration is going to have car, it's going to have chlorine to sanitize it. Um, and that prevents infections and you want the chlorine in it until it gets to your house. But you don't want to be inhaling that chlorine in the shower. It doesn't taste good. So you want the chlorine removed from it by the time you use the water yourself in the house. Um, auto backwash means that the filter cleans itself automatically on its own at night while everyone's asleep. Um, so it's good to have that for your house if you have municipal water. I think the best water supply you could get would be to have well water if you live somewhere where you check the well water and it's good. You know, you don't want to have well water in a place where there's fracking that's contaminating the water supply. But you test the water first. And if it's pretty good water, having a well water is nice because then you don't have fluoride added to it. You don't have anything else added to it potentially. That would be better water quality. Within your house in the kitchen, I recommend having a reverse osmosis filter. Um, and that's for your drinking water. The only thing is you have to be a little careful about a reverse osmosis filter. That can over filter your water, if you will, which might increase your risk of hyponatremia. You know, those marathon runners who kept drinking every 500 yards, they can become water intoxicated due to hyponatremia and they can even have a seizure or die from that. So what's my point? What do I do? I basically always eat first before I drink water. And I end up not really drinking much water because there's tons of water in all these plant foods. There's lots of water in rice. I, mean, I boil my potatoes and boil my sweet potatoes and boil the beans. I get lots of water. I eat a lot of blueberries, and other sometimes some other fruits and whatnot. They contain water. My salads contain water. So it hasn't been a problem for me. Um, uh, and, but that's how I would handle it. I don't know a specific brand to recommend. Um, I do know this. You want to get a TDS tester. They cost about 20 bucks. They look like a pen which is total dissolved solid, which is the number of particles per milliliters. And the gist of it is, it's basically like blood osmolality. Your blood osmolality is in a ballpark of 285 to 300. And it's not exactly the same as TDS, total dissolved solid particles per milliliter, but it ends up being essentially the same, good enough to work with. So what does that mean? Your tap water is going to be in the ballpark of 500 TDS. Your carbon filter water is going to be in the ballpark of 200 TDS. Your reverse osmosis is going to be in the ballpark of 10 to 120. So what I'm basically saying is, with a new membrane on a, on a reverse osmosis filter, you're going to be dropping your osmolality or your TDS down about 10 particles per milliliter. That's too low. That can cause hyponatremia. And that's dangerous if you give it to a kid, you know, like a baby or something. You wouldn't want to do that. Um, so what I'm saying is by eating first, you get more particles in your stomach. Um, in addition, just be careful about it if it's real low. As the membrane gets older, it'll move up towards like around 110, 120. And that's a little safer. Eventually, you'll have to replace the membrane. You don't want, you got to be real careful about drinking the still. Now, I know that some people talk about drinking distilled. I don't have experience with it, but the idea of it does sound like it's of concern to me because the distillation drops the TDS down to zero to two particles. So I worry, does that increase your risk of uh, hyponatremia if you drink that in large amounts? You know, a small amount might not be a big deal. If you're dehydrated, it might not be such a big deal. But if you're drinking that on a routine basis in large amount, I would be worried about that. And I just say that I don't know that much about it because I know there are some people, I, I was interested in water years ago and did a research project on it. I had read more about it extensively at that time. And there were some people who recommended to only drink distilled water. Um, but I, I don't have enough fresh experience on it to, to comment on that, you know, with, with uh, expertise. Great. Thank you. This is from Storm. And she said, you had mentioned that you wouldn't screen for prostate cancer, but do you also believe that women, women shouldn't screen for breast cancer? Well, a lot of it comes down to personal philosophy. What I mean by that is, My experience suggests the smart move to do is lower your risk of all forms of cancer so low that your pretest probability is so low that it doesn't make sense to screen for cancer. Because the average patient, I think, tends to think of cancer screening as like winning the lottery. Well, I better go get checked because I might win the lottery, have an early diagnosis and get my life saved. And what I'm trying to say is the best way you could save your life from cancer is minimize your risk of cancer. 
because I, I mentioned this in my previous lecture on cancer. You can look at cancer as three categories. There's a vault. Imagine you own a giant farm in the center. You have an enclosure with vultures, rabbits, and turtles. If the vulture gets out of the enclosure, it flies out, flies out of your 100 acre farm. There's nothing you can do. You're dead. Okay. But that's super, super rare. You can't scream for it because it happens too fast. The next one is the rabbit. And everybody thinks cancer is a rabbit. And then the rabbit runs for the fence. You got to stop it. Okay. And then the third type of category would be a turtle. The turtle's so slow that even if it breaks out of the enclosure, it'll never get to the end of your fence. You can go on vacation for two weeks and come back. It won't be there. And, and what am I trying to say is patients are so afraid of cancer that they, they lose their rationale. When you actually study cancer, look at these people who've done great, you know, like Ruth Hyders and stuff. They ate low fat vegan diet. They exercise a lot. When you exercise, you activate the NPK pathway, which shuts off mTOR. You get your lymphatic fluid flowing all over your body and um, you help your, what, your WBCs to surveil all your tissues and remove cancer cells, okay? Dr. McDougall's given a lecture showing that by the time a cancer reaches a centimeter, about the size it is before you can detect it, it's already metastatic, okay? And even a, a tumor that small, about a gram, it's already shedding millions of cells every day. You need your immune system intact to remove those uh, cancer cells that have been released into the blood. So what I'm saying is when you agree to screen, you've assumed that you might catch a rabbit and it's going to save your life and be cured. But quite often what ends up happening is you're catching turtles and then you're over-treating a turtle and having tons of side effects. I've seen tons of guys get these low-grade prostate cancers diagnosed. And they're going to go to surgery. The, the doctors are kind of required to provide what is called standard of care. But standard of care is based on patients who are not willing or able to do anything for themselves. Okay. If you're a high functioning individual and capable of reading on your own and studying a disease on your own, there is a lot you can do to minimize your risk. So me personally, I do not go for anything. I don't go for colonoscopy, even though I did in the past because my mother died of colon cancer. But now what I do is I do everything I can to prevent my risk. I went once and the gastroenterologist told me my colon was so normal. It wasn't even funny. And the guy I went to was like, like the best gastroenterologist. Okay. And I also, I do everything to minimize our risk. So I don't want to take that small risk, even though I know it's small, a perforation of post, you know, polypectomy, bleeding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm really, one of the things I like is the peace of mind one gets from this lifestyle and diet. I'm not scared of disease anymore. You know, what I'm afraid of is I got to be careful not to piss people off. They'll beat me up or something <laughs> in terms of, I'm not scared of disease. And I, and believe me, I'm up to my, I'm up to my ears of disease every day um, because I understand it. And I can tell you, this is what you do to prevent it. Um, so the bottom line is I personally don't, and I, I'm, I'm aware of the data. I know Dr. McDougall's lectures. I know the guy who came from the Cochrane Center, and he's a, he's a big believer that mammography is a waste of time, that you radiate your breast with each, each practice of it, and you increase your risk over time from getting the mammograms, and that opinion that you get a lot of false uh, positives leading to unnecessary biopsy. So me personally, I'm a minimalist and I minimize my pretest probability. Because if your pretest probability is low, then you're much more likely to have a false positive and you get all this unnecessary workup and treatment. I'm more scared of that than I am of cancer. And so that's my opinion based on extensive study. But I also can trust myself. I can stick to a diet 100%, not even 99%, 100%, because my life's kind of simple and boring. Um, I don't travel much, <laughs> hardly at all. So, but I mean, it, it depends on the individual, the, the complexity of their life and their ability to have confidence in themselves to follow, to follow this diet and lifestyle. D doc, uh, Dr. Rogers, I don't mean to rush you, but I do have to teach, but I have a couple more questions if, if we have time. If not, we'll have them next time. But you had mentioned the importance of exercise. Would ostensibly an overweight person that exercises regularly be better off than a, uh, a normal weight person that never exercises? Uh, yes, they might not lose that much weight because a lot of times you exercise more, your appetite goes up, but you're more fit. Like we talked about, it's going to improve your insulin sensitivity because exercise mimics the effect of uh, the insulin. It gets the glucose type four transmitters in the cytoplasmic vesicles to go up to the plasma membrane so you can get that glucose in your skeletal muscle. And that improves your overall health. Um, it also, like I said, it gets your AMPK pathway going, which senses low energy post-exercise. And that shuts off mTOR. So these things are likely to help you over the long run to lose weight. They also get your lymphatic flow. They're parallel to your veins everywhere in your body. And they don't have a heart to connect to them. So your exercise is what moves them around to get your lymphatic flow. And that lets your white blood cells surveil your entire body to remove all those metastatic cancers. I personally believe that everybody has cancer cells in their body. And our immune systems are great at removing them. They're fantastic at removing them. Our body is much more functional, adaptable, and capable of healing than we give it credit for. What we should really be doing is saying, what can I help my natural 
immune system to do. And that's how you optimize it and get your sunshine. I think that's under-recognized the value of that. Much better than taking vitamin D pills. Right. Thank you. Jane would like to know what percentage of our diet should be fruit and what percentage should be vegetables in order to get our protein levels 10% or below? Well, uh, like I said, you know, pro the beans tend to be in the ballpark of 25 to 30% protein. So you, the more beans you eat, the harder it is on a plant-based diet to get your protein down around 10% or lower. So you have to make that decision. Other plant foods don't have as much protein. You know, the oatmeal and the quinoa are a little bit on the high side. The typically your rice is in the ballpark. You know, they used to say at the Kempner that it was about 5%. Other people I've read say it's, you know, as high as 8%. Let's call it in the ballpark of 7%. The amount of protein in rice, that's still quite low. Sweet potatoes, remarkably low, about four and a half percent. Uh, regular potatoes in the ballpark, eight and a half to nine percent protein. So those are all low protein foods. Fruits are very low in protein. And maybe that's partly why a lot of these survivors of metastatic cancer have said they eat a lot of fruit. Um, maybe that's one of the benefits. They're alkaline. And they're very, very low in protein. So I think they might have a secret benefit, but the person's got to exercise enough that they don't run into a fructose effect like we kind of talked about. Great. Dr. Rogers, thank you. Such a wealth of information. Do you have any idea what you might talk about next month? Uh, I haven't thought about it. Is there any theme or anything for the month? Like this month was obesity. Let's see. You've talked, I don't know, but um, you've talked about dementia. You've talked about heart disease. You've talked about cancer. Have you talked about autoimmune disease yet? Autoimmune disease? Oh, I could certainly talk about that. Um, yeah, I think, a good one. yeah, I think, I think I'll talk about autoimmune disease now and that'll, that'll motivate me to do some more reading. That sounds great. Thank you so much. It's just, it's a pleasure listening to you. Take yeah, care. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in about 20 to 30 minutes. I just got to eat a quick lunch. And then I have Lissa Maris making a creamy raw apple salad. And tomorrow at 9 a.m., we have a bonus show all the way from Israel, Isaac Oppenheim. If you suffer either with incontinence or getting up to pee multiple times at night, we have a cure for you. You can conquer your incontinence with a sock. How? Come back tomorrow at 9 a.m.